of a basic American principle in government, and by that I mean a system of checks and balances. In substance, the fund was totally unregulated as compared to banks, insurance companies, pension funds, mutual funds. There was really no meaningful public disclosure uh, from what I've seen. And I, I'd like your, with, with, we are all learning from this, and I'd like your thoughts uh, with regard to uh, what you saw uh, is the checks and balances that existed and what you think uh, based upon this bad experience we're all having or have had, what checks and balances do we need? First of all, uh, Rod, uh, the fund had been investigated by the SEC and thoroughly by the rating agencies. Um, because of that investigation, uh, it would indicate uh, to me and others uh, a more confidence in what we were doing. In retrospect, I would uh, presume uh, that a, uh, a fund uh, such as ours could have a, a small board of advisors or um, um, people uh, qualified uh, by, uh, by uh, training and education uh, to advise on uh, what type of investments uh, uh, should be made or uh, a, an investment policy. It seems that all the brokers and all the advisors would benefit financially by increasing the fund size from seven to twenty billion dollars. Uh, if you agree with that, uh, and, they, uh, and they'd earn their, their money on the transactions, on uh, the borrowings, on the public offerings of bonds, if you agree with that, uh, was, there, was there someone in the process that gave you advice that did not benefit from this leverage and all of these offerings and transactions? Speaking from the broker's uh, standpoint. Uh, from the brokers or advisors, I presume they were all paid on a transactional basis and therefore would financially benefit by the fund going from seven to twenty billion dollars. Uh, yes, they, they would. What, did you have any advisors that would not benefit from the levering the fund up? No. Let me ask a couple other questions. Would you agree that a county cre treasurer should not use derivatives for speculative purposes? I just reminded on your your last question. I I did have another advisor of long standing that would not have benefited. Who is that, sir? Uh, Mr. Uh, Al uh, Despirito, uh, uh, known uh, since 1974. And he's with what firm? Or? He, he, he is the manager of, of uh, uh, Dean Witter, uh, presently in the uh, institutional department. But uh, um, um, I rarely bought any securities from uh, uh, Mr. Despirito. And... Uh, I first met Mr. Spirito uh, in 1974 when he came out here uh, when we passed a bill allowing public treasurers to uh, invest in bankers' acceptances, and he was the then trader in uh, uh, the Solomon Brothers in uh, uh, public and in bankers' acceptances. But he had a broad uh, knowledge of uh, the markets and uh, and. Uh, Yield curves and uh, excellent fi Fed watcher, and he gave me uh, a lot of uh, good advice uh, along the years of uh, 
economic uh, situations. But you're, you're, I'm sorry, you're, but you're, before I came back, your, your question again. The question is, would you agree that uh, county treasurers should not use financial derivatives for Rebus, speculation, yeah. but rather to reduce risk? Uh, uh, um, yes, I would, I would now agree with that statement. Do you think a county should borrow money for the sole purpose of having additional funds to invest in the capital markets, based upon your experience? Based upon my experience, no. Would you favor legislation uh, prohibiting the, the, uh, the, the issuing of bonds in effect uh, for the purpose of investing in the capital markets? Based upon my experience, yes. Uh, the National Association of uh, State Treasurers have a, has, a, going back over oh, to 89, a statement in favor of full disclosure of local government investment pools. I don't know if you're familiar with it or not. Say that again, please. This is a National Association of State Treasurers. There's a state, they have a statement in favor of full disclosure for local government investment pools. Not familiar with it. Okay, well, it, it states that there should be a written policy and objectives and goes into lots of detail. Did your office ever have have such a written statement of policy and objectives that the Board of Supervisors approved and the county auditors and others could look at the behavior of the office against that poli the, the, such a po written policy? After the uh, San Jose uh uh, situ financial situation, a uh, state law was passed that required the, uh, the treasurer to submit an investment policy to their governing board, which we did. But that law sunsetted, um, uh, I, don't, I believe it was in January of 93. I see. Thank you very much, Mr. Citroen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Now we are going to um, allow our witness and the members to take a brief break here, and we'll come back because I think this has been going on obviously longer than we had planned. Uh, so we'll come back and, and finish up uh, right after that. So no more than 10 minutes, max 10 minutes. Thank you, Senator. Okay, we're now taking a break from the special Senate hearings going on in Sacramento, which OCN has been and will continue to bring you live throughout the day. We uh, heard testimony from Robert Citron making his first public appearance since the uh, fall of the investment pool back on the about uh, December 4th of last year. He testified that uh, he was not there to place blame on anyone. He was simply there to tell the truth. I have nothing to hide. Yeah, he said, uh, feel free to check into his background. He went on to detail his background, saying that he had never finished college, that he studied predominantly pre-med while in college. And uh, he said that he was a novice investor who relied mostly on the advice from investment firms. We had more education and training in complex government securities. Uh, he was asked by one of those on the panel if he considered himself an investment expert. He then uh, kind of changed his story and said that yes, he thought he was. He especially portrayed uh, that image when he ran for re-election in November against Morlock. You may remember Morlock um, is uh, still a prominent figure here in Orange County vying for his seat. During that re-election campaign, uh, he said that he was an expert. Morlock, however, wrote a letter to the Board of Supervisors uh, warning a, about the potential damage to the investment pool. As far as I knew, neither the supervisors, the county auditors and administrators, nor the professionals familiar with the county's portfolio believed there was any merit to the predictions of Mr. Morlock. 
now. He said that uh, Merrill Lynch's star advisor, Michael Stamenson, had advised him to continue to uh, invest in risky investment plans. He said he started becoming involved in derivatives around 1991. Then he said in 1993 he was advised to cut back on those risky investments by uh, advisors at Merrill Lynch. But Citron didn't take that advice. He said that uh, relying on the success of his pool for the past, uh, for the previous three years, between 1991 and 1993, he didn't see any reason to take that advice. I, I did not believe that the fund was that you state in serious trouble and, until the very, very end. He said by the end of 1993, Merrill Lynch again was pushing him to invest large sums of borrowed money into the derivatives. He said that he had every intention of maintaining the funds over 10 years. He said one of the major investor uh, advisors at Merrill Lynch said that he believed in, uh, interest rates would continue to go down possibly over a 10-year period. And he thought, well, that just meant more money in the bank, more interest for his accounts. And he even went on to quote that. He said, nobody's going to lose a penny on their principal investment investment in this pool. We always felt, as I have previously stated, that we would, we would never have to uh, sell securities at a loss, that, uh, that we had large cash reserves that would protect us in any uh, rise in interest rates. Okay, another testimony today. He said that uh, Merrill Lynch did hold about 70% of the $20 billion investment pool and that because of investigations by the SEC, by Moody's, by Standard & Poor's, he believed that uh, he was doing the right thing. It gave him confidence when a report by Diane Prozen from Standard & Poor's said that they scrutinized the account and they found no real cause for concern. Other information coming out today, he said that uh, Matthew Raby didn't understand the full parameters of uh, the investment account. We will be hearing from him after the break. I think uh, Mr. Citroen still has a little testimony to go. We will also be hearing from the major player from Merrill Lynch, Michael Stamenson. That will be happening at 2.30. If everything goes according to schedule, this testimony did get off to a late start today. He also said uh, the Board of Supervisors uh, were um, aware of the investment strategies that he was using, although he did not give them monthly statements, uh, monthly uh, statements as far as what was going on with the investments. He said that the board um, had full authority to reverse his investment strategies, but they expressed no concern to him at the time. Now, we're going to continue to bring you live coverage of the special Senate hearings as they go on today. We have Pete Weitzner uh, in Sacramento. He will also be bringing you reports this afternoon. Let me give you a lineup of what we can expect throughout the rest of the day. Uh, more from Robert Citron, also his assistant, Michael Raby. We will be hearing from the chairman of the Board of Supervisors, Gaddy Vasquez, Roger Stanton, Stephen Lewis, uh, the auditor controller, as well as uh, some of the major players, the major people who are losing um, in this investment pool loss. Uh, Mac Beard, superintendent from the Newport Mason Unified School District, the business manager from the Placentia Yorba Linda District, uh, Kim Stallings, as well as those heads of the investment firms. Stay with us for our live coverage. Get connected with OCN's Midday and the legal system. Join retired municipal court judge Russell Bostrom Tuesday from 12 to 2 p.m. when he'll answer questions about the legal system. Whether it's an unresolved traffic ticket or a property dispute, Judge Bostrom will be online to help you. Get connected Midday Tuesdays on OCN. OCN Sports Talk, Orange County's only live call-in television sports talk show. Hi, everybody. I'm Dave Feldman. Join us Tuesday night, 10 o'clock, in the locker room. We'll visit with Danny Thompson, the president of Mickey Thompson Entertainment. He'll talk about the new upcoming series going on right at the Big A. Danny Thompson of Mickey Thompson fame. Tuesday, 10 o'clock, in the locker room. We'll see you then. OCN Sports Talk, Tuesday at 10. 
Anaheim officials aren't shedding any tears over the Rams' departure. In fact, city officials are getting ready to woo another National Football League team to Anaheim Stadium. One of the teams it may pursue isn't too far away, the Los Angeles Raiders. Stadium manager Greg Smith says the city's ability to lure a new football team, however, hinges on whether a new stadium is built for the Angels baseball team. City officials will meet with the Angels organization Thursday to discuss a new $180 million stadium. The project, however, could be held up by the county's financial problems. The city may lose more than $43 million, and its credit rating has been put on hold. Meanwhile, the stadium won't suffer financially in the short term. The Rams had to pay off the city's $33 million remaining on its remodeling bonds. The Rams may be going to St. Louis, but at least one of them will be staying behind. Cornerback Daryl Henley goes on trial today on charges that he ran a drug ring out of his Brea home. The Los Angeles Times reports Henley's lawyers are hoping to prove their client had nothing to do with the cocaine trafficking ring. So confident is the defense team that they haven't even entertained the idea of a plea bargain. If convicted, Henley faces life in prison and $4 million in fines. Another complication in Orange County's efforts to buy a new state-of-the-art emergency radio network. It now appears the county's hired consultant for the new communication system had financial ties to the eventual winner of the $82 million contract. As OCM reported, the company that lost the bid is suing, alleging the consultant favored Motorola Incorporated, the contract winner. In a pre-trial interview, the consultant admitted to receiving thousands of dollars from Motorola while he was acting as the county's consultant. County Supervisor Roger Stanton says the consultant's admissions should halt the process until all conflict of interest doubts are settled. Purchase of the new system is already in jeopardy because of the county's bankruptcy. A group of people from Westminster are trying to create a democratic Vietnamese government in exile that will one day depose the communist regime there. Eleven people, including a Buddhist monk, attorneys, a doctor, and former military officials, has been meeting twice a week. They call their Orange County-based group the commission calling for the formation of a government in exile. Vietnam has become one of the poorest nations in the world. The average person earns $300 a year. And since Ho Chi Minh's troops overran Saigon 20 years ago, the Vietnamese have lived under a military-style government with little to no civil rights. Monday, of course, was the national observance of the anniversary of Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday. Throughout Orange County, ceremonies were held to honor the murdered civil rights activist. OCN's Ernabel DeMillo reports on a candlelight vigil at Chapman University. Candles burn brightly in honor of a man who dedicated his life to racial equality. The memorial, held in front of a bronze bust of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, attracted people of all ages and colors. They all took time to reflect on King's message of peace. And I think with I Have a Dream and the rest of Dr. Martin Luther King's speeches, I think he was really saying, just live up to your potentials, uphold your own dreams. Um, well, it just sort of reminds me of, um, you know, figures, you know, in the past that have added something to my life. And, um, I mean, you know, he was a civil rights leader, but also he did a lot for a lot of people. I mean, women, too. The uh, celebration of uh, the holiday means uh, one step closer to the dream that Martin Luther King did have, you know, which was equality and freedom. Dr. King came to Chapman University in 1961 to deliver this speech on racial justice and nonviolent resistance. Many of the students here weren't even born when he spoke, but his words, even 35 years later, ring true today. Dr. Don Will, director of the university's year-old peace studies program, says if King were alive today, he would still be fighting for equal rights. To me, we still face a lot of the challenges he discussed in his later speeches, challenges of economic inequity, challenges of, of racism and bigotry. And the thing I think is most important to remember about it is that Dr. King spoke about transformation. Uh, not simple change, but transformation. And that task is still ahead of us. In Orange, Ernabel DeMillo, OCN. Chapman University, along with UC Irvine, are two of only a handful of colleges in the country to have a department dedicated to peace studies. Earlier in the day, another event to honor the civil rights leader, this one at the Second Baptist Church in Santa Ana. OCN's Lauren Lipsky was there for a special memorial service dedicated to Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Welcome you on this occasion to celebrate with us, and I put emphasis there, celebration, yes, sir. this memorial service. 
In the spirit of unity, that was the message behind a special memorial service at the Second Baptist Church in Santa Ana, honoring the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Many times people are not as different as they appear, and what we all want uh, is very similar. We want safer streets and safer neighborhoods and our kids to be able to go to school without any jeopardy. And I think that's the message of hope that, uh, that I see and I understand. Some of the people attending this service reflected on Dr. King's legacy and how his message helped influence the civil rights movement. It also meant um, being able to go to the same schools as white children. It also meant being able to sit down in restaurants and receive decent treatment. It also meant being able to drink from the same water fountain. Just things that normally people took for granted, that being Caucasians, that we were not allowed to do. Dr. King was assassinated 27 years ago. And many of the people attending the service were not even born yet. But his life's legacy of equality carries on today. Well, it means a lot to me because he set the stage for black people coming up, you know, and that's the reason we're here, just to, you know, serve him and stuff and, think of, and learn more about him, how he, what he did for us, and he's, he really did a lot for the black people. Chaminisha, what does Dr. Martin Luther King's message mean to you? Dr. Martin Luther King taught me that we should all be treated equal, black or white. In Santa Ana, Lauren Lipsky, OCN. King is the first African-American to be honored by a national holiday. Hello, everybody. I'm Dave Feldman. Are you happy? Are you ticked? What are your feelings? Either way, we'll carry it live. 12 noon here at OCN, 2 p.m. in St. Louis for your new St. Louis Rams. Rick Milkey will be there, and we'll have all the word from the St. Louis people Tuesday at 5.50 on the early sports. But for 12 noon, keep it right here on OCN. Watch history in the making as Georgia Frontier signs away 49 years of Southern California tradition, 12 noon, Tuesday on OCN. It's 1122. All morning long, we've been bringing you live coverage of a special Senate hearing going on in San Francisco concerning the Orange County bankruptcy crisis. This morning, we heard testimony from former Treasurer Robert Citron. He was being questioned as they went to a break, a 10-minute break, they said, and he should uh, continue to be questioned after the break. The hearing should resume in about five or 10 minutes from now. We still expect to hear from his former assistant, Matthew Raby, as well as members of the Board of Supervisors, Chairman Gaddy Vasquez and Roger Stanton, as well as uh, people affected by the pool, the major holders, uh, Newport Mesa Unified School District, Placentia Yorba Linda Unified School District, as well as the major players, the advisors from the investment firm uh, Merrill Lynch, uh, Morgan Stanley and Company, and CS First Boston, as well as Leifer Capital. Now, this is a very big day for news in Orange County. Also coming up at about noon today, we're expecting live coverage from St. Louis concerning the Rams. Rick Milkey is on location there. There's a news conference scheduled for noon, and uh, we're hoping this will all coincide maybe with a lunch break from the hearings. That live coverage coming expectedly at uh, noon today as the Rams move to St. Louis. We'll be there. Now, let's go back to Sacramento. That session is resuming with more questioning. Right after lunch, so we'll just have to lengthen it a little bit. Uh, I hope this doesn't cause anyone too much inconvenience. Now we have, uh, uh, the co-chair will be with us shortly. Uh, we have um, now some other members of the, the private members who want to ask questions. Uh, I'm going to ask them if they would, each one try to limit yourself to one question because we're really running out of time. And uh, we uh, want to give everyone a chance, but uh, we, so we feel it's important that you limit it. So now we have uh, Mr. Slesser. Um, Mr. Citrone. Um, in your work over the years as treasurer, uh, did you have any other key advisors besides Merrill Lynch on either the national level where, where I would put Merrill or the local level where you may have had some local bankers or financial advisors? If so, could you tell us who they were?
on a on a uh, regular uh, basis uh, to mainly Merrill Lynch and uh, and uh, I spoke of uh, Mr. Despirito. Uh, time from time to time, you'd get uh, economic reports uh, from uh, other. Uh, economists of uh, belonging to other uh, brokerage uh, houses. I would uh, bruise. Excuse me, Mr. Citron. I think probably, yes, pull the microphone just a little closer. I know after two hours uh, it's uh, yeah. getting a little trying, but so everyone can hear. All right. Thank, no, you. I'm down. Thank you. Thank you. That's fine. All right. Next we have um, Mr. Lentz. Mr. Citron, in a, according to your statement, you consider yourself a layperson and you considered Merrill Lynch as your financial advisor. Merrill Lynch was compensated on a transaction by transaction basis, as uh, Mr. Brode pointed out earlier. Do you feel in any way that the Sorry. present situation is a result of the fact that you didn't have an independent financial advisor and that Merrill Lynch as your primary uh, financial advisor was uh, was not independent and that there was a conflict of interest that, that existed. I, I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't understand it, so I, I think Mr. Citron probably didn't. Um, I understand, Senator Kopp. Could you repeat? Um, the question was, do you feel at all that the present situation is a result of a conflict of interest that existed because Merrill Lynch was compensated on a transaction by transaction basis uh, and that you did not have any independent financial advisor or investment advisor? In retrospect, uh, it appears that way. Uh, Mr. Pugash, do you have a question? Mr. Citrin, I understand that somewhere between 30 and 40 percent of the general revenues of Orange County, the discretionary ones, were generated by your investments in your fund, and that your fund was averaging about 350 basis points higher return than the state treasurers. Um, that suggests that if, if you were to follow a more conservative investment strategy like the state treasurers, this county would have had to cut its expenditures by as much as 10 to 20 percent uh, because it wouldn't have had the money that you were generating for the county, uh, would have resulted in massive layoffs and so forth. Under those circumstances, isn't the problem really not that um, people didn't know that this was an investment, risky investment strategy. You're, you were in the business for 22 years. I find it a little difficult to believe that you don't know that interest rates go up and that they go down and no one at Merrill Lynch or any place else has no um, monopoly on where things are going. Isn't the real problem that people didn't want to face the truth that, that Orange County was hooked on this money that it was getting from the pool and no one wanted to know the truth, uh, that, that uh, it needed the revenues and didn't want to face the facts? There could be a, a, a degree of validity in that statement, yes. Thank you. Um, now, uh, Mr. O'Connor. Uh, Mr. Citron, I'd like to change the thrust of the question uh, away from the management of the pool and operations and get to a specific point in time between November 30th and immediately prior to your resignation uh, on December 5th or 6th. Uh, were you involved, and if so, in any discussions with Wall Street firms uh, other than Merrill Lynch? And I refer to an article in the Wall Street Journal titled, How a Rescue Mission Failed Just Barely in Orange County. And could you tell us a little bit about those uh, meetings and discussions, and most specifically, why, in your opinion, they failed at a minute to midnight? I was not, in, I, I was not privy to those discussions. Do you know who was? At the county, Matt Raby, uh, Ernie Schneider, the CAO, uh, uh, Terry Andrus, the uh, county council, uh, 
uh, Ms. Jean Costanza, the firm of uh, um, um, the Boof uh, Lamb, um, uh, the people from the Capital uh, uh, Management Group, who the uh, county hired uh, 40 days or so previous to that to examine the uh, Orange County uh, uh, pool. Uh, um, did those discussions occur while you were still treasurer? You were excluded from those meetings, or did they all occur after your resignation? I believe they, they began before I uh, resigned, yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Citron, uh, you indicated in your statement that uh, uh, you became increasing... I think we had, excuse me... Uh, uh, I, I apologize. Mr. I... Mossman was next, then we'll certainly okay. entertain your questions. Mr. Citron, I'm curious. There were obviously a number of entities that participated in your fund on a discretionary basis, uh, including a number of entities outside of Orange County. Uh, I'm wondering if, if you or anyone in your office did anything to encourage the participation, and if you would have any thoughts as to whether in the future that participation should be prescribed in any manner. To use a uh, colloquial expression, uh, Mr. Mossman, um, we had to uh, use sticks to uh, drive them off from coming into our pool. Um, 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 as far as the districts outside of Orange County, um, we stopped taking uh, monies from districts outside of Orange County about two years ago. Uh, we had a, first we had a policy that they couldn't come in unless they had the approval of their own county treasurer. Uh, but uh, uh, they they felt uh, uh, those within and without Orange County uh, that they heard that we were earning these uh, very good interest rates, and that's why they wanted to come in. But we in no time went out and on the hustings and uh, lobbied districts to come in. We didn't have to do that. They, they, uh, you know, uh, even uh, last, all through last year, I had uh, cities and uh, districts outside of Orange County uh, that wanted to come in. The city of uh, Beverly Hills uh, called me twice within a four-month period. Thank you, Mr. Mossman. Now, uh, Mr. Hallisey, please. Uh, thank you. In your statement, you indicated that you became increasingly dependent on investment professionals as the government code was liberalized. Uh, what liberalizations of the government code are you referring to? Uh, one. Two, did you, in fact, support some of those liberalizations? And three, would you make any recommendations as far as specific changes in the future? The first uh, so-called liberalization was a, uh, a bill that uh, I re requested the legislature uh, pass, was the uh, purchase of uh, bankers' acceptance securities, which are securities that cannot uh, go out more than nine months uh, to uh, m mature. Uh, the uh, legislature uh, um, uh, originally uh, had a 15% of the outstanding limitation onto it. The legislature raised it to 30%, and then around 1980 it went to 40%. The next liberalization was instituted uh, by the uh, County of Los Angeles Treasurer at that time, in 19, circa 1978 where a law was passed allowing uh, uh, public treasures in California to buy uh, commercial paper up to 15% of their outstanding and to invest in any, uh, uh, any uh, CD offered by any uh, state or national bank. Uh, there is no qualification as to uh, ratings or anything. Um, the next, uh, the next uh, bill, which I was involved in, 
was a medium to buy um, a corporate medium-term notes uh, of uh, not more than um, uh, five years maturity, and uh, they must have been rated A or better by the uh, rating agencies. Um, the uh, next uh, bill, which I also was involved in, uh, was the uh, bill to uh, allow uh, repurchase agreements and reverse repurchase agreements. <clears throat> At that time, uh, everybody in the state uh, and the uh, other than the st uh, at the city and special district and county level were doing uh, repurchase agreements because this is the normal way to manage money whether you have it invested overnight or uh, or or for term um, the <coughs> reverse repurchase agreement was uh, copied by me from uh, a existing state law that allows reverse repurchase agreements and um, 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 one government a a entity, the County of Los Angeles, was doing those at that time because they uh, told by their uh, county council that it would be uh, correct for them to do it. And uh, uh, I thought it would be uh, a uh, excellent uh, opportunity to do uh, reverse repurchase agreements to enhance hands yield. There was other uh, bills that I wasn't involved in. Um, the bill uh, to allow investment in mutual funds. Uh, there was another one uh, allowing uh, option, options and futures that uh, was introduced by I don't know who. <coughs> that generally is what I referred to in my statement as uh, the liberalization of laws in allowing uh, additional uh, and uh, different uh, types of investments. Would you recommend any changes in those? In, uh, in high, having the advantage of hindsight? In the, in the, uh, um, in the uh, bill that authorizes reverse repurchase agreements, I would think, um, in, in retrospect, that there should be a limitation of what percentage of your portfolio you can uh, can um, do reverses with. Uh, uh, the uh, um, um, the uh, leveraging of uh, of um, taking a, an investment that you purchase to reinvest in and then reversing that out, uh, I, sh I would think uh, it should certainly be stopped. It should certainly be stopped. I, I have just one more question. Uh, the Securities and Exchange Commission apparently had some of their attorneys down there in the spring of 1994. Uh, how did that take place? And I, I see the chairman of the SEC seems adept at posturing himself, uh, urging everyone to resign in Orange County, yet he had attorneys there, and he seems very willing to uh, pass the buck to the mm -hmm. county officials. Could you tell Explain that a little bit. We received a telephone call uh, from uh, a, uh, an attorney in the SEC uh, asking us uh, to um, uh, go to their office in Los Angeles. Um, and they wish to discuss um, our investment procedures and, and portfolio. And uh, they were, I guess, reacting to the political uh, 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 
content that was going on uh, during my um, re-election re campaign. Uh, um, we went to the head county council because they had they had said to us, "Well, you can refuse, but you better consult your county council attorney." And uh, um, it was sort of a double-edged sword there, so to speak. So we went to the county council and uh, and and told him about that because we told the SEC attorney that we would get back to him. And uh, he uh, uh, arranged, uh, uh, first of all, uh, uh, the firm of Lamb and uh, LaBeouf uh, had been uh, serving the county for uh, several years as uh, uh, investment uh, advisor, bond counsel on issuance of uh, debt, and they knew a lot about Orange County uh, uh, finances and uh, and the Treasury, and uh, uh, so he went he went uh, to them and uh, asked us asked them to represent them, and uh, on um, uh, that uh, firms. Uh, 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 firms, uh, one of the firm's attorneys was a man named Mr. John Cotton, who had previously been with the S Securities and Exchange Commission as the staff attorney. So he knew their procedures and what needed to be done and so on and so forth. So uh, he contacted the, the person at the SEC and uh, asked what material uh, they would uh, need uh, to have this meeting. Um, the SEC requested volumes of documents. I mean, I mean these cardboard boxes. And I don't know, there must have been 20 of them, of all these documents and records that they uh, requested, and uh, including the, uh, the portfolio and so on and so forth. So on the appointed day, uh, we went to the SEC and had this meeting. And it was not, as you know, a formal type of SEC investigation. And um, uh, uh, so present there was uh, um, the um, myself and Mr. Raby and the county council and a deputy county council and Mr. Cotton. And um, we answered uh, all of their uh, questions regarding our investments and how it was structured and we're using uh, inverse uh, notes and uh, everything about it. And we answered all their questions. Um, they then asked us for additional documents to be sent uh, to them in which when we let next day or so, we sent we sent to them um, um, all their communication to the county went through uh, Mr. Cotton and the law firm of uh, Lamb and uh, Lebouf, and uh, he um, he uh, later reported to us that he had had conversations with them and that they seemed to be satisfied and that they were going to go on to other situations. Thank you very much. Um, now, we are um, going to uh, release this witness in just a moment. I do have, if you don't mind, one follow-up question that has something that hasn't been covered. Uh, in your uh, financial summary, uh, summary financial statement for 93, 94, page five, sort of the top paragraph. You you in, you quote or uh, refer to this favorite president without relationship to partisanship. Everybody's favorite president, Harry Truman, and uh, everybody uses him as a some kind of a benchmark. Mm -hmm. But you indicate that he said at that point that leaders and and business people. Uh, uh, can uh, are successful if they're right 80% of the time, mm -hmm. and you 
indicated that uh, there was this error of 20%, which mm -hmm. you were well aware mm -hmm. of, mm -hmm. and that this probability of error keeps me diligent to see that any miscalculations of economic conditions mm -hmm. do not have an overly a ne negative effect on our investors. Yes. Did you have any kind of contingency plan to take care of that 20%, or was it... Um, were you so? Were you sure of what you were doing that you didn't I was have so a sure I was, You didn't have a contingency uh, plan. I, I was so sure of what I was doing based upon the many years of success that I had uh, that uh, that was the reason for that uh, for that statement. And of course, as I said here previously, um, in retrospect, um, I find that I was not the sophisticated uh, treasurer that I, uh, I uh, said I was. Thank you. Now, for the members, if there's any final brief question, anything that has not been covered so far, uh, would you please speak up now, sir? Yeah, one follow-up on the All right. SEC. Fine, and, and uh, try to keep it brief so we can... Do you know whether uh, that uh, series of conversations uh, was ever reported to the Board of Supervisors or any member of the Board of Supervisors? I have no knowledge whether it was or was not. You didn't yourself. Sir, I didn't. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, all right, thank you. Oh, uh, Senator Hayden, you have... All right, well, very, very briefly, yes, Senator Hayden and then Senator I, uh, I have this August 23rd, 1993 memo from your office to the... Uh, Board of Supervisors. It's marked not for board agenda, and it's a response to uh, the accountant's report. Do you recall that document? The, the, the 1991... Uh, uh 93. Not for board agenda. Response to accountant's report. I think that was relative to the 91 report, isn't it? Right, it's the response to the 91 report. Uh, the, 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 the auditor's reports on our department or any other department right. uh, uh, are, never, are never put on the board agenda. So was this a public document in any sense? Didn't see the, uh, it didn't get to the Newspapers, the no, public, the, no, I, no, it, the board read it. It was sent to the board. I sent can, to the board. I, 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 right. I cannot, I cannot uh, testify who who right. read it. All right, thank you. It, Mr. It, it says we believe all our investment transactions have to be prudently entered into, and we believe none of the transactions to be risky or unusual. Mm -hmm. That's what that's what we believed at that time. Yes. All right, you sent that to the board. Not for board agenda, but it was sent to the board. Absolutely, was sent right. to the board, by, but not by us, by but the county auditor. Uh, Mr. Madam Chairman. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Hurt. Um, just for everybody's information, it's a topic that's been discussed in Orange County. In your opinion, do you think that this uh, job of treasurer should be elected or appointed, and why? All right, is there uh, uh, any other? Yes, all right, excuse me, go ahead. It's a, it's a difficult, uh, it's a difficult uh, uh, question to answer because I have always, uh, Senator Hayden, been an advocate of the, the uh, elective process. Then uh, the public is given the uh, alternative if somebody isn't doing the job they shouldn't do, that they elect somebody else. Uh, we have had uh, there's several, several uh, charter counties in, in this state and, and cities who have asked their, uh, their uh, uh, electorate to make elected treasurers appointive and uh, instead of elective. Happened here a few years ago in San Diego County and in Orange County and so on. And 99 9 tenths percent of the time, the people uh, prefer that those jobs be elective and not of uh, appointed. Thank Would you it make sense um, if they were appointed 
and then the fiduciary responsibility would be spread among not only the treasurer but the board of supervisors and the liability would also be spread. I would presume that there's a degree of... Uh, that way I'm sure we could ensure that there would be some checks and balances yeah. and some follow-up. And unless you can... How'd you get all those Republicans to vote for you, Dennis? Let's, uh, <laughs> We've been wondering that too, Tom. Unless, uh, <laughs> unless, you, unless you can provide uh, through the legislative process that creating other uh, uh, checks and balances that re require the uh, Board of Supervisors to be more involved in the Treasurer's office. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we uh, please step down now. We appreciate your coming and taking all this time, uh, and uh, we. Uh, we're glad to have some of these things on the record. Thank you. Now, I, th I think rather than, um, than try to begin with the next witness, because uh, I think there are f a number of questions for Mr. Raby, uh, we are going to adjourn now for lunch, and we'll be back here at 1 o'clock and um, begin promptly at 1. Madam Chairman, moment. before you break, Madam Chairman. I'm sorry, Mr. Boatwright. Yeah, I just, I just want to make an observation uh, now that the testimony is concluded, uh, Mr. Citron. Several times, uh, I, and I want to express my disappointment, several times direct questions have been asked uh, of Mr. Citron and no answer was ever given. A good example is the question that was just asked by Senator Hurt, a very specific question. What is your opinion as to whether or not we should have an elected or an appointed treasurer? We never got an answer to that. To the contrary, he talked about what uh, charter cities have done and how the electors voted. And I just want to say that I hope we can be more focused with, uh, with other witnesses when they're asked a specific question. I think the person who asked it in this committee deserves a specific answer. That could have been answered yes or no with reasons. We never even got an answer to that very specific question. And I just want to point that out that I hope we can get questions answered specifically when members ask questions. Uh, yes, Mr. Boatwright, uh, Senator Boatwright, I agree with you that it's up to the questioner. And if the witness does not want to answer, then he uh, certainly can say so. Right. Thank you. And that concludes yes. testimony this morning of uh, former Orange County Treasurer Robert Citron. And testimony, uh, he said uh, that he believed in hindsight perhaps there should be a board of checks and balances that keeps an eye on the county investments. He also said that in hindsight he believes that the bill that authorizes repurchase investments uh, for a county be changed to specify the percentage of the investment pool that can be allowed into such risky investments. He restated uh, that he felt he was confident with his investments because of an SEC meeting which uh, investigated his investments and they uh, came back with no cause for concern. He also says his many years of success with the investment pool uh, met with high rates of return, encouraged him to uh, keep going with those risky investments, but he says now in hindsight perhaps that wasn't such a good idea. Let's go ahead and roll in some of the comments made by uh, Mr. Citron during this uh, testimony. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give this committee shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? First, let me express my deep sorrow to the people of Orange County for the financial crisis that has arisen. As treasurer, I followed an investment course that I believe was prudent and suitable to meet the county's growing financial needs. In following that path, I relied on the expert advice of financial professionals. In retrospect, it is clear that I followed the wrong course. I have nothing to hide. When did you first realize that the fund was in, in serious trouble? And in that situation, who did you report this to? And, uh, you know, was it the underwriters, the supervisors, uh, the investors? How did, how did that develop? I, I did not believe that the fund was to state in serious trouble and, until the very, very end. I always believed that the fund was the way it was, uh, uh, the portfolio was, uh, was programmed. 
um, would never have a, a, a principal loss because we would never have to sell securities uh, that had uh, a, 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 until they matured. And here I quote from the Orange County Register, nobody is going to lose a penny of principal. You recall that? I certainly do. And is that substantially accurate, that quotation? That quotation is accurate. Uh, what did you have in mind as a course of action that uh, would indeed result in nobody losing a penny of principal? Because I, I always felt, as I have previously stated, that we would, we would never have to uh, sell securities at a loss, that, uh, that we had large cash reserves that would protect us and any uh, rise in interest rates. And so concludes the testimony from former Orange County Treasurer Robert Citron. Uh, resuming at 1 o'clock, the Senate hearing will then turn to Matthew Raby, Citron's former assistant. Uh, the uh, co-chairman of that board says that they will begin promptly at 1 o'clock. This hearing is running hours behind schedule. We can also look forward to hearing from throughout the day live here on OCN uh, comments from Gaddy Vasquez, the chairman of the Board of Supervisors for Orange County, Roger Stanton, as well as some of the uh, people heading up the groups of investors uh, very affected by the losses here in Orange County and uh, the major players with some of the investment firms. Right now we're going to go to other Orange County news with our live noon broadcast, including a live report from St. Louis, the uh, new home of the Rams. So stay with us. The Young Ducks take to the ice beginning Friday in Edmonton. The home opener is Monday the 23rd, also against Edmonton. The Orange County High School of Arts Musical Theater Department presents The Secret Garden. Performances are January 12th through the 22nd. Tickets range from $7 to $10. For more information, call 310-596-4304. Freya's Youth Theater presents The Sound of Music, a fully staged musical production at the Curtis Theater, January 13th through the 22nd. Tickets are $9.50 for adults and $7.50 for children under 12. For showtimes and tickets, call 714-990-7722. The San Juan Capistrano Regional Library presents a multicultural art series. Friday, January 20th, you can catch a performance by Cephas and Wiggins, a down-home country blues duo. Shows are at 7 and 9 p.m. On January 21st, Adrian Legg, acoustic guitarist extraordinaire, performs solo. Two shows at 7 and 9 p.m. Tickets for both shows are $5 for adults, three for children. The Plummer Auditorium in Fullerton presents Le Ballet Trocadero di Monte Carlo. Don't miss this one special performance Saturday, January 21st at 8 p.m. Tickets are available at the Performing Arts Center box office at 714-773-3371. If you have information of an event in your community, you can write us at the Orange County News Channel, P.O. Box 11945, Santa Ana, California, 92711. Attention, community calendar. Coming up on OCN Live at Noon, a state inquiry into Orange County's $2 billion investment crash is underway now in Sacramento. We'll tell you what's going on. And the Los Angeles Rams are expected to officially announce their move to St. Louis. We'll go there live for the latest. And today marks the one-year anniversary of the Northridge earthquake. We'll take a look back at the costly disaster, and we'll show you how far Orange County has come since then. These stories and more in the next half hour of OCN.
Orange County Register. Get it or wonder what you're missing. As Orange County struggles to recover from its ongoing financial crises, OCN continues to keep you informed with news, headline updates, and analysis weeknights at 8. OCN's comprehensive coverage of Orange County's financial crisis continues tonight. Join me, Pete Weitzner, and business reporters from the Orange County Register as we open up the phone lines to take your questions. Orange County's financial crises, the rocky road to recovery, weeknights at 8 on OCN. Is severe knee or hip pain keeping you down? You may be a candidate for a total knee or hip replacement. Hogue Hospital's joint replacement program can put you back in the mainstream again. And because it's Hogue Hospital, you can be confident that your surgical recovery will be quick and comfortable. For a free video or to attend a free seminar, call 760-5645. See how a joint replacement at Hogue can get you back to your active lifestyle. Call now, 714-760-5645. As a private investigator, I've investigated hundreds of traffic accidents over the past 15 years for insurance companies and their attorneys. Hi, I'm Tom Turner. If you've been injured in an automobile or motorcycle accident, I can tell you from experience you need good legal representation. Remember, the insurance companies have attorneys and investigators working hard on their side. You need the same. Before you talk to anyone, dial 1-800-97-CA-LAW for a free legal consultation. Good afternoon. Welcome to OCN Live at Noon. Today is Tuesday, January 17th. Hi, I'm Leslie Kane. And I'm Mark Bernheimer, topping our newscast this half hour. If you haven't been watching OCN, state senators are trying to get to the bottom of the county's bankruptcy fiasco in Sacramento today. A special Senate committee is taking testimony all day long and is now on a lunch break. Before the break, we heard from the key player in the debacle, former Orange County Treasurer Robert Citron. And uh, we'll try to get you uh, Robert Citron's words a little bit later, uh, and the uh, whole thing will resume after lunch. Right now, we're going to bring a reaction from somebody else involved in the fiasco, or at least indirectly involved. One of the people closely watching Robert Citron testify before the special Senate panel was John Morlack. He's the certified public accountant who lost the election to Citron, despite his warning the Board of Supervisors that Citron's investment practices would lead to financial losses. Morlack watched the OCN special broadcast on Citron, repeatedly uh, indicating he took financial advice from a single member of the Merrill Lynch investment team. Morlack says Citron's admission of the oversight, which cost Orange County $2 billion, was no surprise. He says the responsibility ultimately ended with Citron, but he also said the system was set up for failure. Well, he should have realized that somewhere along the way he needed to disengage, and he never disengaged. And, and he was the pilot of the plane, the captain of the ship. But he had people in the cockpit, and he had people that voted him in, and, and the, the co-pilots. I mean, we're all culpable. Shockwaves from a disastrous, uh, should say, Morlack says he and other people saw that interest rates were going to rise and, like others, can't understand why Citron didn't see those problems. Uh, Morlack also blamed the Board of Supervisors for not heeding his warnings before the election. Morlack says the special Senate committee hearing could lead to new legislation which might prevent another debacle from occurring. He says if asked by the county, he will uh, interrupt his accounting business to take over the helm uh, for Citron. Okay, again, that special Senate hearing now on a lunch break. It will resume at 1 o'clock, and you can catch it here live on OCN. Meanwhile, shock waves from a disastrous earthquake in Japan are being felt here in Orange County. The 7.2 shaker that devastated the port city of Kobe was recorded by local seismometers. An emotional shakeup is also taking place. Japanese Americans living in Orange County are concerned about their friends and relatives. Many are trying to contact their relatives outside Kobe and are having no success. About 30,000 Japanese Americans live here in Orange County. Well, it was a year ago today that Southern California was rocked by what proved to be one of the costliest disasters in this country's history. Orange County, as well as Ventura and Los Angeles counties, fell victim to one of the century's biggest earthquakes. OCN's Greg Ricks takes a look back. Most people were sleeping when it hit. It was 
432 and it started shaking and rumbling and I have two cats and they were running across the bed. It happened at a time when no one was around. That's the most important part. Of Orange County was pretty lucky. No one here died in the 6.7 Northridge quake. Elsewhere, 57 people were killed. Nearly 9,000 were injured. About 114,000 buildings in L.A. and Ventura suffered damage compared to just 19 in Orange County. The Big A suffered the most extensive damage. Meantime, transportation here was halted for only a day. I just like how the streets buckle the tracks and do the same thing. And that's what I look for, plus the bridges right now, just to make sure none of them are collapsed. Our runways were fine. We uh, did determine there were, uh, I believe, a couple of tiles, ceiling tiles that were just a little bit loose. The price tag of Orange County's damage was a mere fraction of the Southland's total bill, $20 billion. That makes it one of the nation's costliest disasters ever. Because Orange County was left relatively unscathed, it quickly became the hub for emergency relief efforts. Well, we've been basically on a 24-hour mission tasked by FEMA. Everybody working together for a common cause and uh, the ability to, to take that cause and put it into action. Orange County volunteers went by the hundreds to help other quake victims. You wish you would have met them at another time in a better situation, but they've been absolutely wonderful. We don't know what we would have done without them. One year later, all signs of the earthquake here are gone. Even the Big A has a new $3.6 million scoreboard. But although the physical damage has been fixed, the Northridge quake is an event that people who live through it say that they'll never forget. I'm Greg Ricks, OCN. More than 6,000 aftershocks of the Northridge quake have hit Southern California since the big one last year. Today, President Clinton was scheduled to tour Cal State Northridge to get a look at the quake repairs, but that was called off because of a bomb scare. Even though it has been one year since the Northridge earthquake, many Orange County government buildings are still unsafe and need seismic reinforcement. The county has 15 unsafe buildings, and its current financial crisis puts into question when those buildings might be fixed. The city of Orange has set aside $1.7 million to help business owners reinforce the 60 unsafe buildings in Orange's historic downtown area. Laguna Beach, meanwhile, has retrofitted 11 unsafe buildings. Instead of paying the high cost of retrofitting, La Habra has demolished. 15 unsafe buildings and Brea plans on demolishing six buildings. In all, 100 buildings declared unsafe have been retrofitted by their owners during the past year. First, an earthquake hits, and then you think about what to do. At least that's the way it happens for many people, but emergency workers say it should be the other way around. The one-year anniversary of the Northridge earthquake provides a reminder to all Orange County residents to be prepared. As OCS, OCN's Catherine Blake tells us, a little planning can go a long way. Any part of California, including Orange County, could experience a serious earthquake at any time. But studies have shown most people in the state aren't prepared for such a disaster. Do you have anything stored away or anything? Absolutely nothing. So what do you think you're going to do if it hits and you're at home? <laughs> um, I'm going to believe and trust in God I'll be okay. But emergency workers say that kind of attitude doesn't cut it. Most injuries are caused when people panic. And that kind of reaction can be prevented with a little planning. I think the number one thing you can do to lessen your anxiety is to get your family and loved ones prepared. Experts say no matter where you are when the shaking starts, you need to protect yourself from flying objects by making yourself a small target. You do that by sitting on the floor, ducking and covering your head and neck. After the shaking stops, you'll need some supplies on hand to tide you over. When it comes to food and water, a three-day supply should do it. But you may also need several other items, including a first aid kit, a flashlight, a radio, blankets, medication, and personal hygiene items. If you're driving when a tumbler strikes, don't let fear guide your behavior. You should try to pull over to the side of the road or the emergency lane as quickly as you can, but as slowly as you can. Don't make a, anytime you make any quick movements, you scare not only yourself, but the people behind, and it just causes a chain reaction. Learning how to prepare for an earthquake doesn't cost a lot. For just $5, your family can attend a class at the Red Cross. If you can get a group of at least 20 people together, many fire departments will conduct a free workshop. And judging by the effects of last year's Northridge earthquake, preparation seems to be well worth the effort. In Santa Ana, Catherine Blake, OCN.
If you'd like information on earthquake preparedness classes, call the Orange County Red Cross in Santa Ana or your local fire department. You might remember 11-year-old Carrie Burlow. He's Orange County's only storm fatality. Well, he was buried over the weekend. But his family says they can't move on until they can afford to pay for the headstone for his grave. As OCN's Lauren Lipsky reports, a Mission Viejo hair salon is trying to make a difference by helping the family with a fundraiser. A fundraiser at the Belladonna Hair Salon in Mission Viejo to help the family of Carrie Dean Burlow, the little boy who drowned while trying to cross storm-swollen Tribuco Creek. He used to take care of my son when I played softball on Wednesday nights. And he was a good kid. And I, we just want to do something to make a statement because he was very loved. Lana Robinson and Brenda Foster are the two stylists who came up with the idea and proposed it to the store owner. Uh, this is a very tragic situation and the family is um, in need of support and I think the best way of helping somebody is to reach out and be there and do whatever you can to um, let them know that there are people out there that care. And it seemed like a really good cause, and I was in need of a trim anyways, and I just felt really bad about what happened to the little boy, and, you know, I feel for his family, and I have little kids of my own, so I just thought it was a really worthwhile cause. Some of the customers here may be too young to realize what their haircut really was about. Others skipped the trim and simply donated money. The people here at the salon say it is their hope that when all receipts are tallied, that they will have raised about $1,500 for the family. In Mission Viejo, Lauren Lipsky, OCN. Now, in addition to the headstone, the money raised will also go to help Burla's family with other expenses resulting from the tragedy. Well, time permitting, we'll have Orange County business news when OCN continues. And we'll also go live from St. Louis, the new home of the Rams. Stay with us. OCN Sports Talk, Orange County's only live call-in television sports talk show. Hi, everybody. I'm Dave Feldman. Join us Tuesday night, 10 o'clock, in the locker room. We'll visit with Danny Thompson, the president of Mickey Thompson Entertainment. He'll talk about the new upcoming series going on right at the Big A. Danny Thompson of Mickey Thompson fame. Tuesday, 10 o'clock, in the locker room. We'll see you then. OCN Sports Talk, Tuesday at 10. Register. Get it, or wonder what you're missing. Former State Senator Paul Carpenter was sentenced today to more than seven years in federal prison. The sentencing comes nearly a year after the Cypress Democrat took off to Costa Rica to avoid incarceration on political corruption charges. A U.S. District uh, Judge was clearly angered by Carpenter's flight. In addition to sentencing Carpenter to 87 months in prison, the judge ordered Carpenter to pay more than $50,000 in fines. Carpenter was convicted in 1993 of serving as the middleman in a plot to funnel bribes from a powerful lobbyist to the chairman of the Senate Insurance Committee. Judge Gar the judge also placed the terminally ill Carpenter on three years of supervised release after he completes his sentence. Meantime, Carpenter has been undergoing treatment for prostate cancer.
A group of people from Westminster are trying to create a democratic Vietnamese government in exile that will one day depose the communist regime there. Eleven people, including a Buddhist monk, attorneys, a doctor, and some former military officials have been meeting twice a week. They call their Orange County-based group the Commission Calling for the Formation of a Government in Exile. Vietnam has become one of the poorest nations in the world. The average person earns $300 a year. And since Ho Chi Minh's troops overran Saigon 20 years ago, the Vietnamese have lived under a military-style government with little or no civil rights. Well, another complication in Orange County's effort to buy a new state-of-the-art emergency radio network. It now appears that the consultant the county hired for the new communication system had financial ties to the winner of the $82 million contract. As OCN has previously reported, the company that lost the bid is suing, alleging the consultant favored Motorola Incorporated, the contract winner. In a pre-trial interview, the consultant admitted to receiving thousands of dollars from Motorola while he was acting as the county's consultant. County Supervisor Roger Stanton says the consultant's admission should halt the process until all conflict of interest doubts are settled. Purchase of the new system is already in jeopardy because of the county's bankruptcy. Well, there is other business news today apart from the bankruptcy hearings, and we're going to turn to uh, the Orange County Register's Jeff Rowe now to get the rest of it. Jeff. A little bit of good news to start us off. The nation's industry is churning out goods today at, the rate, at, at a rate uh, an all-time high for the last 15 years. Uh, only in economics, though, could uh, good news have uh, a, a bad lining. And the dark cloud in this is that economists now are worried about inflation overheating and pressures then uh, expected to build to cut interest rates even further. Wall Street didn't like the, the inf uh, factory report either. The Dow Jones down four points at uh, 2 p.m. on Wall Street. The dollar mixed against other European currencies. Gold prices higher today. Here in Orange County, still no word yet from Walt Disney Company on, on what's going to become of that proposed $2.75 billion expansion at Disneyland. But today, Disney did move Ken Wong over to its Imagineering unit. Wong, you might recall, had headed up Disney's development company, the company that plans and, and actually builds the theme parks. Uh, we'll have more on Disney as we learn it today here on OCN. And finally, a study in today from Khan Consulting in New York shows that family-run businesses more prone to financial problems than those not run by families, apparently problems with family squabbles and mismanagement. That's a business report. Thank you very much for that. Jeff Rowe with Business. Okay, now Pete Weitzner is joining us live from Sacramento. He's attended those special Senate hearings involving Orange County's bankruptcy, and let's go to him now. Hi, Pete. Hi, Leslie. Uh, what are you observing there today? <laughs> what I'm observing is, I'm sure, the impression of uh, the folks who watched the hearings this morning, and for those who didn't, Bob Citron was the hearings this morning. He gave a fairly long opening statement and then spent the rest of the morning taking questions from this special state panel on local government investment. Interesting, I think, think maybe the most stern or pointed questions came from the Orange County contingent. Uh, Senators Rob Hurd and John Lewis, uh, also uh, the, uh, the panel is chaired by Bill Craven. Uh, but the show was Bob Sitcher, of course, he's, he's spoken barely a word, uh, mostly on the advice of his attorney since December 1st and the news first broke of the loss in the bond pool. But I think maybe the upshot of what we saw and heard from Bob Citron is that the man we've read so much about, the hubris we've heard so much about, when he would go on the road and pitch his strategy and brag about his high returns, uh, we saw none of that in evidence. We saw the antithesis of that uh, this morning. Uh, in fact, I'm told even physically, folks who are familiar with him from years past, he looks a good deal more frail. In fact, that is kind of how he looked, of course, on December 1st. He barely gave a, uh, a, a comment at that press conference. He apologized. He, uh, he said he didn't know as much as he thought he did as far as being a sophisticated investor. Uh, but other than that, while his appearance and the impression is different from what we've read about, his story is fairly constant. He relied on Merrill Lynch, even went so far as to say the SEC, who talked to him in April because they were concerned about John Morlock, his challenger's comments, that the SEC in effect blessed his portfolio. And he insisted he did everything to the full knowledge of the Board of Supervisors and the full pleasure of his many investors. Yeah, I think one of the initial surprises was that he decided to answer all of the questions full-faced. He didn't hide from anything. Well, I don't know if everyone agrees with that, Leslie. In fact, the last, this, I the last statement only there. because the last comment uh -huh. you may have heard from the Senate panel members, I, I wish we could get direct answers. I'll say this in defense of Bob Citron. Anyone who watched the Whitewater hearings will feel this man was going beyond answering the questions. But that was, uh, they may as well have taken the fifth. So in these scenarios, it, I mean, we expect there's a possibility that he will not be answering questions. 
Yes, he answered some. There, I think there were some revelations. Yes. Uh, maybe the most, is, uh, the biggest thing, is last comment when he said I, I wasn't as, to put it simply, I wasn't as good as I thought I was. Uh, and I think maybe, perhaps a, a bit of a reach, but interesting his comment that he felt the SEC uh, also signed off on his strategy. Uh, he laid off a fair amount of um, credit, if you will, some might say blame, on Merrill Lynch that he adhered to their strategy and their opinions on interest rates, that it was Michael Stamenson who pushed them to do uh, the different type of reverse repurchase agreements in 91. And again, he went as far to say that the law is too liberal, allowed him to do reverse repos, perhaps too much. One final note, I had an interesting conversation with uh, State Senator Tom Hayden uh, at the break, and uh, maybe you uh, remember his comment saying, how did the uh, Democrat get all those Republicans to vote for him in Orange County? And Hayden, as some probably wouldn't be surprised, uh, didn't hesitate to put forth the suburban conspiracy theory, and that the reason Bob Citron was elected and, and that the Republicans even supported him is was either raise taxes in a post-Prop 13 environment, or hope Bob Citron could outperform the market. And so according to Hayden, they chose uh, clearly, uh, the Citron testimony was the highlight, or expected to be the highlight, of today's testimony. What are you looking forward to for the rest of the day? Well, yeah, I good to look forward to. We've, and as much as we've read and heard about Bob Citron, we've also read and heard a lot about Michael Stamenson. This may be the most famous broker in the country. Not only the pitchman to Bob Citron, but ten years ago, the pitchman on derivatives to San Jose. Uh, extremely affluent, throws famous parties, put them off this year. Uh, by the way, because of the notoriety of the Orange County situation. He'll speak, you know, they have, they've broken out in the four segment, segments real quickly. Uh, the first was Bob Citron, that was the, the treasurer's handling of the portfolio. The second is supervision, so we'll get Gatty Vasquez, Roger Stanton, who's reported a little bit. We're having some problems hearing you, but thank you very much for that report, and uh, we will check back with you later. Pete Weitzner, who is in Sacramento, covering the hearings for us. Right, and we have uh, Rick Milkey in St. Louis, and uh, Dave's going to go out to him in a little bit for a live shot on that. That's right, I'll tell you what. Uh, we're uh, less than five minutes away. I'm being told, everyone, from the official St. Louis announcement at the convention center. All the big players are there, including Georgia Frontier, who will make a very rare public appearance. She won't do it in Southern California. She will do it in St. Louis, along with John Shaw. She will officially sign the papers and therefore say the Rams are moving to St. Louis. It won't officially be done until the March meeting when the NFL owners get together. 23 of the 30 have to agree that the team can move, but they don't. Uh, foresee that there is going to be opposition. They think that the owners will approve. You don't want to tick other owners off in this league because you never know. It could come back to haunt you. And so Mark and Leslie, in about four minutes, will go out to St. Louis. And uh, actually, we're going to keep it right here because I'm told uh, they're getting ready to go to the podium. Once again, a 49-year tradition in Southern California will come to an end as the Rams the oldest franchise in Southern California leave to move to St. Louis. Part of a five-year plan for John Shaw as you're looking live at the convention center in St. Louis. Shaw advised Georgia to sell this team five years ago. She wanted a profit. She said, no, I want to keep this team. He said, all right, here are the other options. Let's try to move the team. And that's going to be our best option. So she took all his advice. They had suitors that looked like maybe they'd go to Baltimore. Baltimore was the front runner for a while. And John Shaw, in fact, said those had the best football fans. They elected not to go to Baltimore. John Shaw even said, St. Louis, I don't know if they care enough about football. They lost a team. Some said maybe that was a little bit of a ploy to get St. Louis back. You can say what you want about John Shaw, the vice president of the Rams, but you can't say he's a bad businessman because he certainly knows what he's doing. I believe now we're going to go to St. Louis and to the convention center be businessman Stan Kroenke also there as well as the rest of the entourage but we're still waiting for Georgia Frontieri and no lights yet over by the door so apparently she's not ready to go just yet guys. All right that is Jeff Colley over there in St. Louis and we're going to go back to there as soon as they have a statement but uh, let's get you up to date a little bit on what's going on here. The Rams are going to go to St. Louis. That's a done deal. They will probably make a 20 million dollar profit in 1995. That's a good enough reason to move. They will have a new stadium. They will have a new practice facility. They've got all this coming back and we've got to take you to St. Louis. We'll pause for a commercial break. We'll do that when we come back. This is Charlie Fox. Here's the exclusive OCN Ski Report for Orange County. In our local mountains, we can expect the following weather conditions for the next 24 hours.
Up in the Sierra Mountains, skiers will find these conditions. And the next 24 hours in the Rockies looks like this. That's what's in store for Orange County skiers headed to the mountains. Remember, for the most comprehensive list of ski resort condition and weather reports for your favorite mountain areas, watch for the OCN Ski Report Tuesday through Saturday. I'm Charlie Fox. For three years, OCN's Pete Weitzner has reported daily on the business of Orange County. James Doty is president of Chapman University and a nationally respected educator and economist. Together, they host OCN's Chapman Report. It's all the news about Orange County business you need to know. Concise, informative, timely. James Doty, Pete Weitzner, The Chapman Report, daily at 6.15 a.m. and 8.55 p.m., exclusively on OCN. Now is the best time to buy high-quality, contemporary, and traditional oak furniture. Oak and welcome back. This is an OCN yeah, yeah, yeah. special it's report as we are going live to St. Louis, the convention center, where some prominent St. Louis businessmen, along with Georgia Frontieri in the green, and John Shaw are going to make an official announcement about the Rams ending a 49-year Southern California tradition and moving to the Midwest. All right. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. Welcome to America Center, one of the greatest convention centers in the United States. Today is a great day for this community. For the last nine months, we have been working around the clock trying to bring NFL football to St. Louis. Today is the day that the dream of a team of our own is now a reality. There are many people in this room that have been an integral part of the effort to bring football to St. Louis, and I will introduce them shortly. But as the mayor of this great city, I wanted to be the first to say it to the Los Angeles Rams and to their owner, Georgia Frontieri, welcome back to your new hometown. Ladies and gentlemen, Georgia Frontieri. Let's give her a big hand, please. The St. Louis Rams, how sweet it is. Bringing NFL football to St. Louis has been a goal of this community for many years. Our hope is that the St. Louis Rams will become a real part of this community. That the team and its players will be the pride of St. Louis both on and off the field. Our hope and our strong desire is that the Rams will win games on the field and will win the hearts of children and families in our neighborhoods and our communities for many, many years to come. Now, let me introduce to you a man who we almost gave a heart attack, but has won the hearts of many in this community and around the nation for a lifetime of public service. Tom Eagleton, who will speak to you later in this program, He has been a mover, a shaker, and has worked tirelessly in this effort to bring football to St. Louis. When we began to negotiate with the Rams, we realized that this was a full-time job. We decided that it would be impossible for Dick Gephardt, Buzz Westfall, or myself to be able to focus all of our attention every day towards getting this team done. We knew that we needed a driver. We knew that we needed someone who had the skill as a negotiator, the respect of this community, 
and someone with a national reputation for honesty, decency, and integrity. In the past, he may have been known as a great politician, a respected and distinguished U.S. Senator, even the elder statement, statesman of our community. But from now on, we will just refer to Senator Eagleton as Mr. Football in the St. Louis community. It is with that in mind that I'd like to ask Tom Eagleton to come up here and join me and be the first to sign the relocation agreement with the St. Louis Rams. the story that I'm about to tell you right now, but is one of great importance in the long journey and the long quest to bring an NFL team to St. Louis. Last April, after our unsuccessful effort to bring an expansion team to St. Louis, a lot of people in this town were just too discouraged to talk about football. Some of them would hide. Dick Gephardt wasn't one of those individuals. He asked Buzz Westfall and I to join him for dinner at Chemo's one day because he wanted to talk about football. Dick Gephardt was convinced that we needed to give this effort one last try. When we got there, he told us that he had spoken to John Shaw of the Rams and thought that the three of us needed to create a community-driven effort to bring an NFL franchise to St. Louis. And in many ways, that dinner was one of the main reasons that we are here today. It took someone with Dick Gephardt's love of our community and belief that if we just put our minds to it, we could get anything done in the St. Louis community. Sometimes my daughter, when she doesn't think I'm paying attention to her, and she's four years old, she'll pull me on my sleeve and she'll say, Dad, I'm serious. Dick Gephardt and this St. Louis effort was a serious effort. In Dick Gephardt, we have a national leader who was willing to put his work in Washington, D.C. aside to fly across to Los Angeles and make the initial pre presentation with us that demonstrated the commitment of our community to get an NFL team. And it made us a serious contender to be the new hometown for the Rams. Ladies and gentlemen, I am proud to introduce to you Congressman Dick Gephardt. Thank you, Freeman, very much. I don't know about you, but I'm pumped up about St. Louis and about the Rams. I have been an avid sports fan my entire life in this city. I'm a Cardinals fan, a Blues fan, I was a Hawks fan, a Spirits fan, and I was a football Cardinal fan, and I have waited and wanted this day to happen for a long time. As a public official, I'm excited about what a professional team will do for our local economy and for the revitalization of what I think is the greatest downtown in the entire United States. And to show the rest of the country, and to show the rest of the country that St. Louis is a big league town.
But the effort to bring the Rams to St. Louis has really been about something more than sports and more than economics. This effort proves that if the people of St. Louis together set a goal and work together to achieve it, this community, community can tackle the tough challenges that face our community. Many people thought that after the expansion process didn't go our way, that it would be a long, long time before we got professional football. And there were many who predicted that it would never, ever happen. But let me tell you, we proved together the naysayers wrong. I am confident that professional football through the St. Louis Rams is going to be a huge success in this town. And my hope is that the community spirit that prevailed in this successful effort to bring the Rams to St. Louis will be the inspiration for the many serious efforts that lie ahead to improve our great community. Let me finish today by welcoming Georgia Frontier, John Shaw, and the Los Angeles Rams to our community. We are proud of you. We are proud that you're with us. And we look forward to a bright, long, prosperous future for both St. Louis and for the St. Louis Rams. Welcome to St. Louis. This time, I'd also like to give special recognition and thanks to the members of the city's Board of Estimate and Apportionment who have supported us in this effort, the Comptroller of the City of St. Louis, Honorable Vervis Jones, and the President of the Board of Aldermen, the Honorable Tom Villa, who have backed us in this play 100% all the way. You know, any civic leader in this community could have stood out and shot down this deal at almost any time if they had wanted to. But to give you an indication of the support that the St. Louis community had, everybody was involved in this effort. And it took everybody working together to make this happen. And it is a privilege and an honor to have been a part of it. And on behalf of the city, I would like to say thank you to each and every one of you. I'm pleased to introduce Mr. John Ferrara, who is both president of the Pasta House Company Restaurants and a dedicated, non-paid St. Louis public servant. As chairman of the St. Louis Convention and Visitors Commission, John runs the organization that sells St. Louis to the rest of the world and operates this fine convention center and dome stadium that we are about to participate in. John has been instrumental in negotiations with the Rams from the very beginning and was a major player in this effort. Ladies and gentlemen, my good friend, John Farrar. Can we sign up here first? Yeah. Wow. Well, early last summer when we came back, uh, my first trip to LA, there's not many people that gave us a snowball's chance in hell of putting this together, but here we are, folks, and it happened, I'll tell you. Uh, and I, I'll tell you what, without the, the guidance of our, of our elected officials, and I'm talking particularly about the initiative of Dick Gephardt and his leadership, the leadership and tenacity of Mayor Bosley and County Executive Westfall, the two guys that really brought all the resources together to get this deal done, and without the leadership of our state and city treasurer, Tom Eagleton, the Walter Cronkite, as I've been calling him, this negotiating team, the most credible guy in the state, this would have never happened. What we've seen here is politics at its best. Having said that, I'd like to welcome Mrs. Frontieri, John Shaw, the whole Rams organization to St. Louis, and on behalf of the Convention and Visitors Commission and the hospitality industry, to tell them we, we wish a long and prosperous, fruitful, 
co uh, effort of cooperation for the next at least 30 years and hopefully for a long time after that. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, John. I'd like you to meet the man who is responsible for the construction of this amazing facility, which will be the new home of the St. Louis Rams. Bob Bear is the chairman and chief executive officer of United Van Lines and chairman of the Regional Convention and Sports Complex Authority. From day one, and I mean day one, Bob worked tirelessly to make sure that the stadium was on time and, ladies and gentlemen, on budget. It has been a massive undertaking, and he, along with the other 10 members of the Stadium Authority, have done a phenomenal job to build us a first-class facility and the finest facility of its kind, in my view, in the world. This stadium is one of the most important reasons that the Rams chose St. Louis as their new home. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Bob Bear. Thank you. Thank you, and I want to add my welcome to our new St. Louis Rams. In my judgment, St. Louis is a great sports town, and I'm absolutely convinced that our fans are going to prove it to you. This magnificent convention center and stadium is the result of the city, the county, and the state coming together to build a public facility which will have a significant long-term economic and unifying influence on our region and on our state. Not enough can be said about Tom Eagleton, Buzz, Dick and Freeman, and they have brought us the team. They deserve a great deal of credit. I think also, however, that credit is due to some others. Let's not forget John Ashcroft when he was governor for his early support and his leadership, Governor Carnahan for keeping up the momentum, to county executives Milford and, of course, Buzz Westfall, to Mayor Shamel, who was very active initially, handed off to Freeman Bosley, who's been our real ambassador, to the City Board of Aldermen, to the County Council, and to the Missouri General Assembly. And of course, to the city, county, and state taxpayers. It couldn't have been done without them as well. The Sports Authority decided early on that this project was so important to this community that it had to be an inclusionary one. And in fact, it has provided real economic opportunities for businesses large and small, men, women, minorities, labor unions, contractors, all working in unison in this unprecedented city, county, and state effort. Special recognition is due to our executive director, Larry Akeley, and his staff, who in my judgment has gotten too little credit for their just outstanding contributions and unswerving commitment to this project. Thanks, too, to our legal advisors, Soltaus and Walsh, People, Hales, and Coleman, and to the many, many, and I mean many, fine professionals in the financial, architectural, and engineering communities who have shown extraordinary dedication and commitment to this project. My personal thanks to my fellow commissioners, past and present, who have given so unselfishly of their time and their talent. In all, many talented people have shown that it can be done by working together, bringing us to this day when we welcome the St. Louis Rams. We believe the Rams have made an outstanding decision choosing as their home a facility which will stand in future years as a tribute to the great people of the city, the county, and the state. And thank you very much. You know, there's a saying that you, you save the best for last. Many people don't realize how important it is for the success of a community and for a region that the mayor and the county executive work together in a partnership. Our current county executive, Buzz Westfall, and I 
have forged a very close working relationship that is based on mutual respect, trust, and friendship. We are grateful, we are all very grateful to have Buzz Westfall serving as our county executive. He is always willing to work together and try to reach solutions to the issues facing our city and our community and our region as a whole. Buzz is tough and strong will, but has a great sense of humor and always brings a positive and upbeat attitude toward his work and to the projects that we undertake. He was in the zone on this project and would not let up until it was complete. Throughout this entire effort to bring the Rams to St. Louis, Buzz Westfall was a real motivator, always reminding us to stay focused and believing that we could make this happen and make football a reality in St. Louis once again. He is a major asset to this community, and I look forward to working with him in the many years to come. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm proud to introduce my good friend, Buzz Westfall. It's hard to write bigger than Freeman Bosley, but I, I tried to do the best I could. What do you think of this tie? Can you all see this tie? It's the Ram logo. It doesn't say Los Angeles, doesn't say St. Louis, but in a few months it's going to say St. Louis Rams right above the logo. Let me just tell you, I've got 5,000 of these in the trunk of my car, so any of you who want to talk to me after the press conference, I'll be out in the parking lot. You know, a lot's been said about Tom Eagleton, and I guess now he's Mr. Football. There was a time in, in ancient history when he was almost Mr. Baseball, but now he's going to be Mr. Football. And people have been worrying about, you know, saying, not worrying, but saying that, you know, this is a, a crowning, a fitting crown for a great career. And he truly has been a treasure to the state of Missouri and the St. Louis area and a great way to end his career. I haven't been worrying about this effort to get the Rams here ending Tom Eagleton's career. I've been worrying about it ending his life. <laughs> But he's still healthy and it's not going to end either his career or his life. He's going to continue doing great things for St. Louis and for the state of Missouri. It's my pleasure before I say a few words about the effort to get the Rams here and what it means to St. Louis to... All right, you're watching live the convention center in St. Louis where the Rams are officially moving there. Lee Steinberg joining us now, the sports attorney based in Newport Beach and head of the Save the Rams committee. And, and Lee, I imagine, is this a, a very sad day for you? Well, it's a, a, a going to be a sad day for St. Louis when they realize that this battle is by no means done, but is just beginning. And uh, remember, it is one thing. It, remember, it is one thing to to talk about uh, having signed a sales agreement. It is a horse of an entirely different color to get the NFL to vote for uh, this move. So, Lee, you think the owners, 23 of 30, would have to approve it for this move to go through, and you don't think that's going to happen? Dave, um, uh, before you know, we listen to any more of this uh, windbag rhetoric <laughs> <laughs> from uh, St. Louis, just remember that it's only eight votes which are needed. Now, the entire... Uh, uh, country thought that the San Francisco Giants were going to move when they made a similar announcement two years ago. The National League voted them down. The Minnesota team, uh, the Timberwolves, did the same thing earlier this year, made a deal with a group of businessmen. They were voted down. How can it be in the best interest of the National Football League to take a city which a year ago they rejected rejected in an expansion process and then allow our team to leave the second largest market in the country and to go there. Do you notice as you're watching this press conference one bit of concern by one St. Louis official for the young kids in Southern California who are going to lose their team for our economic development, for uh, anything other than, than stealing a team for another market? Yeah, well, Lee, let me ask you this. Do we want the team, though, with this management? Clearly, John Shaw has been orchestrating this plan for five years. Georgia wanted a profit. He's promised, him a, uh, promised her a $20 million profit. Do we want a team that's going to keep this management still in Orange County? It's very critical to Orange County that we not have this team 
tell the rest of the country that Orange County is not a suitable place for business development and cannot support an NFL team. It sends a devastating message to to businesses in Wall Street in terms of the vitality of our community. Look, on top of going bankrupt and, and uh, plagues of almost biblical proportions uh, with a fire, a flood, an earthquake, um, we need to have professional football here. And the exciting entertainment corridor, which would have a new football stadium, a new baseball stadium, a, a, uh, a contiguous U.S. Disneyland and convention center, as well as the pond, would bring the first nightlife and the first real uh, vital entertainment zone to Orange County. We can beat this deal back, and the league can vote no. I was going to ask you that. Was the Save the Rams offer better than the St. Louis offer? Well, this is uh, where it's infuriating to, to hear Ram officials say they had no choice. Every person listening knows that we proposed a brand-new state-of-the-art stadium facility along with a... Uh, a buyout of the whole team for $200 million, or alternatively, we have local investors here that are willing to uh, put up $50 million. We talked about guaranteeing and guaranteeing 50 thousand uh, seats as well as new luxury boxes as well as building them a new practice facility there is no way that over a series of years st louis can be more uh, uh, profitable for the rams than a winning well-run team here in southern california so the offers were not that far uh, apart and if for the sake of argument tomorrow um, someone wants to take the, quote, St. Louis Cardinals and move them to Nome, Alaska and offer $5 million more million, since when does that a good policy for the NFL? Remember, uh, Dave, that teams who enter the National Football League are not private businesses able to do whatever they choose to do. They're forced to do things like share revenue. They're forced to follow league regulations. They're not simply private businesses. It's a little ironic to have the Rams sit and say, you know, we're a civic treasure. We're part of the cultural fabric. We're entitled to all the dollars uh, that we can get from uh, the public because we're so important. And then turn around and say, no, 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 we've been here for 50 years, but uh, we're just a private business. We can leave if someone offers $1 more. Now, Lee, I know you grew up in Southern California, and the Rams have been here 49 years. I know you're not giving up the fight. We'll talk about the fight a little more in a second. But you believe that if the Rams do go, it's not going to be easy to get another pro football team back. No, Dave, the difficulty is that you have municipalities all across the country who desperately want to get these franchises. They don't have our uh, financial problems. They're not always the biggest urban cities, and they can put together private-public consortiums of money that are very difficult to compete with. Remember that Oakland has not gotten another team since they lost the Raiders. Neither has Baltimore gotten a team back. So it's not simply a snap to go and get another team. All right, Lee, quickly tell me, what is the move now that you guys must do? How do you, do you start to rally? Do you call all the owners? Do you say vote against it? But before you answer, Lee, I know you want to hear this too. Let's hear from Georgia Frontieri, and then we'll go back to Lee Steinberg in Newport Beach. This is Georgia Frontieri, the majority owner of the looks like going to be St. Louis Rams. Why don't you? I don't know if you are right now, but I don't you anyway. Is she signed now? Thank you. <laughs> I'm overwhelmed. <clears throat> I don't think I've been this happy since the last game we won. <laughs> I've had about 10 pages of notes and I won't bore you with everything, but there's a lot in my mind and a lot in my heart. You know, St. Louis and, and I, have a lot in common. We've both shown our good faith in each other, faith in the future together. We've both made a very bold move, one that neither of us has taken lightly. We're embarking 
on a journey together that gives us the opportunity to move forward with great pride. St. Louis, you have a stadium that is nearly ready. A lot of things have to be done to make it what we really want, but we have visions. And by the same token, a lot of things will have to happen to make the Rams the team that we all envision. And I'm going to make sure that those begin the minute this conference is over. I personally am going to meet with each and every player and their family. And I think when they see the vision that exists here, they'll be so anxious they'll, they won't be able to wait. <clears throat> so many of you work so very hard <clears throat> to make this dream a reality. Do you know, <clears throat> St. Louis has taught me a great deal. You know, I grew up here, and one thing about the people in St. Louis and all of my teachers, they instilled in me the principles of honesty, integrity, persistence, and the will to succeed. <clears throat> I'm so proud to be able to come home after this long journey in my life. I don't mean to imply that long, <laughs> but all I can say is that I've never stopped loving and being proud of St. Louis, and I'm so thrilled to be back and to be able to bring something to what I will always consider my hometown. Thank you very much. Uh, Lee Steinberg, I know you just watched that, and you probably don't feel like celebrating to cool in the gang, do you? Wasn't that wonderful and heartwarming? <laughs> you didn't buy it, did you? Well, let's just uh, remember that they had the same sort of uh, celebrations in uh, New Orleans when, when the basketball team from uh, Minnesota was supposed to go there. They had the same thing in Tampa Bay. That really means nothing. What means something is the fact that the Rams have said to the National Football League that they will go through a vote. Yeah. And it only takes eight votes or a third of the owners to, to block it. There are now 30 teams. Um, so we have been lobbying very strongly for the last uh, four or five weeks, and we'll continue the lobbying effort. We're going to make a presentation on behalf of Orange County, which will involve some of our state's leaders, some of our uh, county leaders, a presentation we were never able to make to Georgia Frontieri. Can you believe after 50 years of the team being here, she never would even meet with a local group to talk about uh, saving the team? Well, the NFL will meet with us, <laughs> and we plan to be there um, showing just how vital uh, 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 Southern California is to the National Football League and what a wonderful opportunity the team would have to uh, stay here. Um, 
look, if they don't want to leave the team here, sell it. St. Louis was never in the NFL plans. We plan to uh, be very active. We expect there will be a league meeting probably in March that will vote on this matter, and we will be there with a very strong presentation. Lee, you have players, uh, you represent players that play for many different teams in the NFL. You know a lot of the owners. What's your feedback around the league? Do you get some feel as to how the owners are going to vote in March? People are stunned that uh, Mrs. Frontieri has never seen fit to even meet with the group trying to keep the uh, team in Orange County. They seem to have had a very deliberate plan that they followed for some period of time to try and, um, in essence, scorch the earth, create a set of circumstances with low attendance, with, uh, with a, 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 a team, so they could turn around to the NFL and say, look, there's not suitable support here. Well. Um, there are large legions of hardcore Ram fans. There are large legions of Ram fans who are just disaffected at the way in which the team has been run. And uh, we will make these points in a compelling way, along with uh, uh, my co-chair Jack Lindquist and Wayne Wadeen and a, a Sir Frank Bryant and a series of leaders in Orange County. We will make these points as effectively as we can and keep the team here. Lee, you're not a psychologist, but if you're looking in the head of Georgia Frontieri, does she do it strictly because of financial reasons or maybe the more popular reason now? You see, she was applauded. She got a standing ovation in St. Louis. She comes here. She just sees signs that say, hey, Georgia, go home, sell the team, please. All I remember is uh, Frank Bryant, the head of the Booster Club, going up and having a meeting after the proposals had been made for six months publicly from Orange County to the Rams. And Frank makes the point that she doesn't have to worry about attendance because there are guarantees. And evidently, Mrs. Frontieri turned to Frank and said, um, uh, oh, John Shaw, you mean there are guarantees in this proposal? <laughs> So she wasn't really dialed into what was happening. Well, we don't know, but um, uh, we still think that it's the best thing for Georgia Frontieri not to uh, to end her life in St. Louis, but in, in Southern California. And, you know, no one in all of this talks about how fair it is. There are young kids all across Orange County who are big Ram fans. There are people throughout Southern California who have grown up for years. Since when did it become acceptable NFL policy to allow an owner to not talk to or counter uh, an offer from local fans and simply uh, trip off into the sunset? Right. Okay. So, Lee, you get right to work. The meetings are in March, and now you're going to at least, do you go out and talk to all these owners or do you, the proposal? How soon do you get this ball rolling? Because I imagine time is not on your side right now. The ball is rolling. If you recall, we had a uh, press conference two weeks ago to announce that we knew that the Rams were moving. This is something that we've expected, and it's something that's been clear for, for some time. But again, we believe we can counter this within the league, that our case for Orange County is a compelling one. And uh, Ram fans, don't lose, lose heart. Keep those letters rolling to NFL owners, write to Paul Tagliabue. We can uh, turn this around. Okay, Lee Steinberg from Newport Beach. Thanks a lot for the visit, Lee. I know you're going to be busy. And with all this, do you even get to enjoy the Super Bowl? you got a quarterback uh, for the 49ers who's going to get to represent San Francisco. Yes, it, uh, uh, someone once said that God created the concept of time so that everything wouldn't happen all at once. <laughs> but it's been sorely abused. And thank you to OCN. We owe you, you know, a debt for being there to uh, cover cover this and, and let fans really see what's happening. All right, Lee. Lee Steinberg from Newport Beach. Not really a great show that he wanted, but he knew it was expected, and, and he doesn't seem that shocked. They are going to rally the troops. They are going to try to get some owners to vote against it. 28 of 23 of 30 owners must accept the move. So if eight say no, then the Rams will not be going to St. Louis. Lee Steinberg thinks he can get it done. So Leslie and Mark, uh, he's very optimistic over there in Newport Beach. And you know, Dave, before we take this any further, I have to point out that it didn't go unnoticed that Georgia Frontieri omitted any reference whatsoever to Anaheim or Orange County in, right. her, uh, in her address. Also, John Shaw, the guy who put this whole deal together, who's the uh, head of the Rams, the vice president, and uh, 
they didn't even mention him, and he is the guy responsible mainly for making this move. He has got Georgia's right hand, uh, right ear. He, he is the one, she is the one that he listens to, and it was a financial deal that he put together, and he, we didn't hear from John Shaw. He's not a very popular guy here. I thought he would have been very popular in St. Louis. John Shaw conspicuously absent uh, from the press conference there. And those, realistically, uh, those in the know uh, who believe that um, the NFL will turn, the owners will turn down this proposal uh, are pretty much in the minority, are they not? I, I, right now, it looks like they will go. Lee is optimistic, and, and I would love to see the Rams stay here, and I hope Lee's right. But from what I have heard, I think it's going to be tough to get the, vote, the owners to vote it down. Okay. Yeah, it's yeah. going to be hard to put the champagne back in the bottle. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, they're already celebrating full force up there. Yep. All right. Thank okay. you very much for that, Dave Feldman. And, uh, of course, you can watch uh, highlights and uh, a recap of the uh, events in St. Louis throughout the day here on OCN. But now we want to turn our attention back to Sacramento. Mm -hmm. and that's where the hearing, a special Senate hearing, has been going on most of the morning. It's scheduled to resume any minute now. They promised before their break at uh, about 11.30 that it would be resuming promptly at 1 o'clock, but it didn't. It didn't get off on time this morning. The original, the original uh, program, I shouldn't say program, the schedule called for Robert Citron and his former right-hand man Matthew Raby both to testify between 9:15 and 11 o'clock this morning to wrap that all up and then by this afternoon after the lunch break we were expecting to hear from Supervisor Stanton, Supervisor Vasquez but as you saw if you watched this morning uh, all the questioning and uh, all the lengthy answers took up the entire morning and when they adjourned for lunch at noon the only person we had heard from is Robert Citron. Right it was apparent when you'd look at the schedule an hour and 45 minutes to hear from the two key Key players, if you will, in this whole debacle. Um, you know, just an hour and 45 minutes, that isn't much time. No word yet what they plan to do if they can't wrap this thing up within the day, because we also expect to hear from some of the key players, some of the people representing the agencies that stand to lose the most, uh, the Newport Mesa Unified School District and the Placentia Yorba Linda District um, coming up this afternoon. Also, the uh, heavy hitters from the investment firm. So I don't see how they're going to have uh, enough time for all of that. And recapping, anyone who wasn't uh, able to watch this this morning, we this morning repeatedly heard Robert Citron deny a full responsibility for the fiasco and whenever possible and wherever possible shift the blame to Merrill Lynch, uh, the people who are responsible for the purchase of the bonds themselves. Uh -huh. Saying, I have nothing to hide, that the investment firm uh, Merrill Lynch predominantly, Michael Stamenson and uh, Charles um, Shobe, Shobe, uh, told him, advised him, that uh, they were doing the right thing. Those investments were the way to go. He did say at one point in 93, they said that it looks like you might be in trouble, maybe you should let go of some of them. But then at that time, Robert Citron said that he felt that everything was going so rosy, that he was making such great returns on his investments between 1991 and 1993, that he went against that advice. Why don't we go ahead and listen to some of the things that uh, Robert Citron had to say this morning. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give this committee shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? First, let me express my deep sorrow to the people of Orange County for the financial crisis that has arisen. As treasurer, I followed an investment course that I believe was prudent and suitable to meet the county's growing financial needs. In following that path, I relied on the expert advice of financial professionals. In retrospect, it is clear that I followed the wrong course. I have nothing to hide. When did you first realize that the fund was in, in serious trouble? And in that situation, who did you report this to? And, uh, you know, was it the underwriters, the supervisors, uh, the investors? How did, how did that develop? I, I did not believe that the fund was to state in serious trouble and, until the very, very end. I always believed that the fund was the way it was, uh, uh, the portfolio was, uh, was programmed, um, would never have a, a, a principal loss because we would never have to sell securities uh, that had uh, a, 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 until they matured. And here I quote from the Orange County Register, nobody is going to lose a penny of principal. You recall that? I certainly do. And is that substantially accurate, that quotation? That quotation is accurate. 
Uh, what did you have in mind as a course of action that uh, would indeed result in nobody losing a penny of principal? Because I, I always felt, as I have previously stated, that we would, we would never have to uh, sell securities at a loss, that, uh, that we had large cash reserves that would protect us and any uh, rise in interest rates. Well, some were surprised this morning when uh, Mr. Citron started with his testimony that he didn't take the fifth. There was some speculation that he wouldn't answer the questions at all because he is going to be held fully accountable for anything he says today. It is admissible and, and the chance that there is a criminal filing in this case. And uh, one might get the impression from what one just saw that Robert Citron was entirely forthcoming and to the point when asked uh, the various questions, some of them rather tough questions by the senators, but not all of the senators believed that he was being that way throughout the entire uh, questioning process. At the end, one senator admonished Mr. Citron uh, regarding what he believed was Citron's reluctance to be straightforward and uh, ducking of the questions, if you will. I'm not using the exact words here, but right. to the same effect, not, not uh, addressing the questions directly and sort of talking around the issues. Right. That was Senator Dan Boatwright and one of the other people on the panel said, well, it's in part up to the people asking the question to demand the answer out of them. It might be interesting to see what happens when uh, Assistant Treasurer Tax Collector uh, Matthew Raby is questioned um, and asked as we reported before, that was supposed to happen some 12 minutes ago. It hasn't happened yet. But as soon as it does, as soon as those hearings resume up in uh, Sacramento, we'll bring them to you. Um, one of the things that was interesting, the only bit of conflict in his testimony that I saw, well, there are a few, but um, at one point he said that uh, he wasn't up to speed as a, an investor, as the uh, treasurer, and that he wished he'd known more, that he never graduated from school, that it wasn't his specialty. But then uh, when elections rolled around, in November, he was telling a completely different story. Yeah, it's a very interesting case, and uh, certainly by far the most we've heard from Robert Citron since all of this developed, because seeing as he's been in seclusion uh, since it all break, broke. What we're going to do now, I think, is take you back to uh, some more general news from the day around Orange County, and uh, the minute that these hearings resume, and as we said, they were supposed to resume at uh, 1 o'clock, we'll take you right back for continued live, uninterrupted coverage of the Senate subcommittee hearings in Sacramento. Stay with us. Orange County residents trying to get through to quake-ravaged Kobe, Japan to check on the welfare of friends or relatives living there are probably going to be having trouble today, not because the lines have been severed between the U.S. and Japan, but more likely because the Japanese government is requesting that calls from the United States be limited and that the lines be used primarily for emergencies. If you have friends or relatives and you can't get through to Kobe, we have two numbers for you where you might be able to reach some assistance. If you are calling about civilian people, civilian Americans living in Japan, the number to call is 202 647 0900. Once again, 202-647-0900. If you're calling to check on the welfare of military personnel stationed in Japan, the number is this, 703-697-5737. 703-697-5737. Of course, the big earthquake in Japan revives memories of a quake that hit Southern California one year ago today. Of course, we're talking about the huge Northridge earthquake. Orange County, as well as Ventura and L.A. counties, fell victim to one of the century's biggest quakes. OCN's Greg Ricks takes a look back. Most people were sleeping when it hit. It was 4.32, and it started shaking and rumbling, and I have two cats, and they were running across the bed. It happened at a time when no one was around. That's the most important part of Orange County was pretty lucky. No one here died in the 6.7 Northridge quake. Elsewhere, 57 people were killed. Nearly 9,000 were injured. About 114,000 buildings in L.A. and Ventura suffered damage compared to just 19 in Orange County. The Big A suffered the most extensive damage. Meantime, transportation here was halted for only a day. I just like how the streets buckle the tracks and do the same thing. And that's what I look for, plus the bridges right now, just to make sure none of them are collapsed. Our runways were fine. We uh, did determine there were, uh, I believe, a couple of tiles, ceiling tiles that were just a little bit loose. The price tag of Orange County's damage was a mere fraction of the Southland's total bill, $20 billion. 
That makes it one of the nation's costliest disasters ever. Because Orange County was left relatively unscathed, it quickly became the hub for emergency relief efforts. Well, we've been basically on a 24-hour mission tasked by FEMA. Everybody working together for a common cause and uh, the ability to, to take that cause and put it into action. Orange County volunteers went by the hundreds to help other quake victims. You wish you would have met them at another time in a better situation, but they've been absolutely wonderful. We don't know what we would have done without them. One year later, all signs of the earthquake here are gone. Even the Big A has a new $3.6 million scoreboard. But although the physical damage has been fixed, the Northridge quake is an event that people who live through it say that they'll never forget. I'm Greg Ricks, OCN. To date, more than 6,000 aftershocks from the Northridge quake have hit Southern California. Today, President Clinton will tour Cal State Northridge to get a look at quake repairs. One year after the Northridge earthquake and many Orange County government buildings are still unsafe and need seismic reinforcement. The county has 15 unsafe buildings and its current financial crisis puts into question when those buildings will be fixed. The city of Orange has set aside $1.7 million to help business owners reinforce the 60 unsafe buildings in Orange's historic downtown area. Laguna Beach has retrofitted 11 unsafe buildings. Instead of paying the high cost of retrofitting, La Habra demolished 15 unsafe buildings and Brea plans on demolishing six buildings. In all, 100 buildings declared unsafe have been retrofitted by their owners in the past year in Orange County. First, an earthquake hits, and then you think about what to do. At least that's the way it happens for many people, but emergency workers say it should be the other way around. The one-year anniversary of the Northridge quake provides a reminder to all Orange County residents to be prepared. As OCN's Catherine Blake reports, a little planning can go a long way. Any part of California, including Orange County, could experience a serious earthquake at any time. But studies have shown most people in the state aren't prepared for such a disaster. Do you have anything stored away or anything? Absolutely nothing. So what do you think you're going to do if it hits and you're at home? <laughs> um, I'm going to believe and trust in God I'll be okay. But emergency workers say that kind of attitude doesn't cut it. Most injuries are caused when people panic, and that kind of reaction can be prevented with a little planning. I think the number one thing you can do to lessen your anxiety is to get your family and loved ones prepared. Experts say no matter where you are when the shaking starts, you need to protect yourself from flying objects by making yourself a small target. You do that by sitting on the floor, ducking and covering your head and neck. After the shaking stops, you'll need some supplies on hand to tide you over. When it comes to food and water, a three-day supply should do... The Special Senate Committee on Local Government Investments, in particular Orange County's Soured Investment Pool, is getting back into session now. Let's go out to it, some pictures of that session that's going on live However, in Sacramento. OCN has been bringing you the live testimony this morning from former Treasurer Robert Citron. It continues now with testimony from Assistant County Treasurer Tax Collector uh, Matthew Raby. Now let's see, we have, um, they're just sitting down to uh, begin the questioning. We'll start out this afternoon session with Matthew Raby's statements. He'll have testimony. That will be followed by questioning from the panel, probably similar to what happened this morning with Robert Citron. Question, you will so state. B, in the absence of such a statement, your answer to each question will be entirely voluntary. C, if you choose to testify, you will be sworn under oath and will therefore be subject to criminal prosecution for perjury committed in testifying. If you choose to so testify voluntarily, you are reminded that any self-incriminating statements you make can be used against you in a criminal proceeding. Mr. Raby, do you understand these statements regarding your rights before this committee? Yes, I do. Do you wish to testify voluntarily under the conditions presented? I do. Will you please stand and raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear or affirm that you, the testimony you're about to give this committee shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. <laughs> Thank you. Now, we'll, yes. 
We have provided the committee with uh, an opening statement on behalf of Mr. Raby, um, but we will uh, waive a reading of it at this time as long as it's our understanding that it will be uh, uh, placed in the record as if it read by the witness. I think, I don't know how the rest of the committee feels about that. Uh, could we have a summary of it just to, uh, I think, to tie us in for what, what will be coming in the, word, in the way of questioning? Well, I, I gave Mr. Johnson copies for each of the senators, and um, yes, here it is. I haven't, I haven't had an opportunity. And I to have more if you if you'd like them. Just got it this morning. I think most of the members haven't had a chance. Go ahead. It's not very long because we none of us had a chance to, or very few of us had a chance to read it. My name is Matthew Raby. I am 38 years old. I am an accountant by training. I was hired by the Treasurer Tax Collector's Office in Orange County in July 1987 as a senior accountant. Before working for the Treasurer's Office, I was an auditor with the County Auditor's Office. Before that, I worked in various capacities with Sears, Roebuck & Company. In my first position with the Treasurer's Office, my primary responsibilities were maintaining the county's banking relations, managing the county's deferred compensation plan, and overseeing the accounting operations. When I was appointed Assistant Treasurer in March 1993, I was given additional administrative responsibilities, overseeing issuance of the county's short-term debt obligations, and serving as Mr. Citroen's alternate on the county's pension board. In general, I was given full responsibility for the non-investment operations of the Treasurer's Office. Your Chief Counsel, Scott Johnson, has been kind enough to provide me with a list of areas of interest to this committee. As to those questions about which I have information, I am glad to provide whatever assistance I can. It is clear, however, <coughs> that your inquiry is focused on many questions for which I do not have definitive answers. My knowledge of the county's investments comes from information provided to me by others who had direct and primary responsibility for such investments. Beginning in approximately 1992, I was assigned responsibility for responding to inquiries about the pool from pool participants and others with information about the pool. I also participated in occasional internal discussions about the pool's investment strategies and the general workings of the pool. On the other hand, there were limits to my working knowledge. <clears throat> I did not, for instance, understand how quickly and to what extent the structuring of individual securities would affect the portfolio as interest rates continued to increase. As you know, I first alerted various county officials to certain concerns I had with the pool in late October 1994. Since that time, I have been working very long days, often including weekends, in an effort to help the county work its way through its problems. I have worked closely with the people charged with resolving the problems of Orange County and pool participants. Because of this, I have not had sufficient time to review and reflect on the documents and materials which should be reviewed to fully answer many questions that might be asked. Even if I had the time, I would still have been seriously hamstrung since many key records and documents have been seized by the Orange County District Attorney's Office and as a practical matter are very difficult to obtain and review. The task you have set for yourselves is not an easy one. One measure of that difficulty may be my experiences since last October. Notwithstanding my general knowledge of the pool prior to October and my efforts since then, I have come to realize in the past two and a half months that those of us who are untrained in the complicated and somewhat bizarre aspects of derivatives and government agency securities cannot begin to suggest how to regulate their use. It is now clear to me that even when I first addressed my concerns to county officials, I did not have a full understanding of the magnitude and nature of the problems we are now facing. Indeed, it was not until after an intensive evaluation by outside experts was conducted in November and December that I learned generally of the magnitude of our problems. It saddens me deeply that the residents of Orange County have suffered and will suffer so greatly as a result of these problems. Accordingly, I support the goals of this committee to understand what happened in Orange County and to take steps to avoid any reoccurrence of such a situation. I want to help in that effort. I will try to answer your questions to the best of my ability, recollection, and knowledge. Thank you very much. Now, 
just to <coughs> start out with a few questions, and I'm sure there'll be others. Right, How were you chosen as Assistant Secretary? What was the process there of your being designated that job? I was called into Mr. Citrin's office um, by Mr. Citrin and Mr. Wells, the former Assistant Treasurer, and I was told that uh, Mr. Wells was retiring and that I would be taking the position of Assistant Treasurer. Mr. Wells at that time was the assistant treasurer tax collector, and another person was appointed the assistant tax collector. And with the combination of the jobs, then was your responsibility primarily on the uh, on the treasurer side rather than the tax collector yes, side? Yes, that's correct. Yes. Um, what do you what did you view as your responsibilities as assistant treasurer? What was the range of responsibilities you had there? It's important to know that. <clears throat> Excuse me, it's important to know that um, when I had my previous position, I had uh, a number of responsibilities. When I became the assistant treasurer, I retained all of those responsibilities because the previous position I had been was eliminated. In addition to the previous responsibilities that I had had, I was put in charge of making sure that the county's short-term debt issuances were achieved and in serving as Mr. Citron's alternate on the pension board. And additionally, I, I worked with other county departments on long-range planning assignments. And um, in the question of the charge of the treasurer, uh, from the Board of Supervisors, in other words, what uh, what they uh, indicated to him of, do you, do you have any, what was your understanding of what your responsibilities were, the Treasury Department uh, responsibilities were to the Board of Supervisors? I was not given any direction on what the Treasurer's responsibilities to the Board of Supervisors were at any time I was there. And th were you curious about this? Not particularly. Mr. Citron had been in office for 20 years at the time that I became the assistant treasurer. He was a very experienced treasurer, and I presumed he knew what he was supposed to do. And um, in specifics, what was your role with the bond deals? Um, did you? How did you get involved in the uh, the floating of the bonds? That side well, of it. Which bond deals would you be referring? I'm to? referring to the uh, the. the uh, hiring of underwriters and and so on the whole whole process of uh, obtaining uh, bonds there the county had a short-term debt issuance program and a long-term debt issuance program the long-term debt issuance program was handled through the county administrative office and I was not one of the persons who assisted in the selection of underwriters or financial advisors or other consultants toward that the short-term debt issuance program, which would be issuances of 13 months or less, was handled through the treasurer's office, and Mr. Citron selected who the underwriters would be and referred those to the Board of Supervisors for final approval. And actually, the way Mr. Citron gave it was that the Board of Supervisors told him who got the low bid, who, who, they, who he should select. So. Uh, the emphasis is a little different here. Well, there there may be some discrepancies in, in I, I don't want to speak for Mr. Citron because I don't know how he understood your question, but um, most of the debt that was issued by the county was of the long-term nature, and in, and in those instances there were different procedures than there was for the short-term debt. Now, who set the amount of, uh, of these bond issues? How was that arrived at? What was the decision on what was needed and what, what magnitude? Did you have any role Are in that? Are we talking about the short-term debt or the long-term debt? Well, we have to be the short-term because if the administrative officer, as you say, had complete control over the long-term, then presumably the treasurer's office had very little to do with it. That's true. In, in the area of the short-term debt, the the sizing of a uh, issue, and normally here we're talking about the tax-exempt trans issues, uh, those are done through consultation with uh, the bond councils, the financial advisors, and uh, the county auditor's office and the county treasurer's office to, to make sure that the issuances do not exceed the, the legal limitations. Uh, the taxable notes were sized in a different manner. Now, the treasurer's office, the treasurer submitted official statements, uh, annual statements of the condition of the investment fund and, and the philosophy that was going on and so on. Who did that? Who did those uh, statements? Did you have a hand in, in those statements? Uh, it's, it's important to know Mr. Citrin was filing those statements for over 20 years. And uh, I was only named the assistant treasurer in March of 1993. I was not involved in the preparation of the statement that he filed 
in the fall of 1993, which would have been for the 92-93 uh, fiscal year, I did have some input into the statement which he filed for the 93-94 fiscal year. And what about the statements, the disclosure statements on specific bond issues? Um, who gave the information that was used by the uh, Disclosure Council on those, on those statements? Well, generally speaking, on the issues that we were involved with, the, the base document that, that was used for disclosure would come out of the county administrative office. They, they had the standard document, which would then be revised um, by the financial advisors and the Disclosure Council and the Bond Council and the others who, who had input into the document. Now, um, there's been reference to uh, an investment advisory committee. Did that exist? And if so, who was on it and how many people? It's, it's my understanding, <coughs> excuse me, um, that when I first came on board in 1987, that, that shortly after that time there was an investment advisory committee. That that committee was formed uh, in response to an audit recommendation. I don't know how often that committee met, and I don't know how long that committee lasted. Did you ever participate in any uh, meetings with that advisory committee? No, at, at that time I was an accountant in the treasurer's office, and I had no interfaces with that committee So whatsoever. once you became assistant treasurer, there was no opportunity for you to That committee that. was not in place when I became I assistant see. treasurer. Oh. Now, um, do you think the Treasury or the, or the Treasurer or the Board of Supervisors have a fiduciary role with respect to the investment fund? What do you understand that to mean? Well, I, I'm not sure I completely understand what you mean by a fiduciary responsibility. But That's what I want to know, what, what you uh, understand by it. I'm not really <laughs> sure that I, that I have an understanding what it is. I, I wouldn't want to speak for what Mr. Citron's responsibilities were as the county treasurer, and I wouldn't want to try to speak to what the Board of Supervisors' responsibilities are. But wouldn't that re reflect on the kind of job you did and what your responsibilities were? My responsibilities, generally speaking, were administrative and accounting responsibilities. I was not the person who set the investment strategy. I was not the person who made the investment decisions. There seem to be a lot of documents uh, of which your signature uh, is at the end of these documents. Yes. What kinds of things did you, uh, did you actually sign off on? That would have my final approval or, or that I signed? Well, uh, explain the difference if there is one. Well, I think there's a major difference. In the areas that, that related to the administrative aspects of the office, I was the one who had the responsibility for making the decisions and, and signing those documents. In handling responses of, to inquiries that were made by people in the, in the investment fund and in signing documents that had to do with the bond issuances, those items were reviewed and approved by Mr. Citrin before I signed them. But you were generally well aware of what went on before you actually signed, before you got the document Well, I was sign. generally aware of what the investment practices were of the office. I was generally aware of the types of securities that Mr. Citron was buying, certainly. Um, now, can you give uh, some, what your understanding was of the two different funds, the commingled and the, and the uh, bond fund, what the difference, uh, how that was handled? how the difference was handled in that, how, how that difference of the tax rate and so on, uh, tax exemption well, applied. Sometime in uh, around 1989 to 1990, uh, there were a number of uh, persons who expressed an interest in investing their bond proceeds in the county treasury. And the yield at that time that Mr. Citron was earning on the investments was significantly higher than the yield on the bonds that were going to be issued. And that created an arbitrage rebate um, problem for those entities, including the county. And so Mr. Citrin established a separate pool uh, for which he was going to manage the proceeds of bond issuances. And as far as you know, that was carried out in that way with two separate... Um Separate funds? Absolutely. There were, there were separate accounting records. There were separate investments purchased for the commingled fund as opposed to the bond fund. Uh, because um, in order for you to operate, did you have an understanding of any 
formal kind of policy that the Treasury uh, Office had in carrying out the responsibilities there? The Treasurer's Office had a statement of investment policy and, and we had uh, some policy and procedure manuals for how to handle the different functions within the office. Now, the state law does limit the amounts, amount of certain types of securities within an investment fund. Uh, did you know of those limits, and do you know if they were exceeded? There are, <coughs> excuse me, there are certain limits to the government securities. We would prepare monthly reports for Mr. Citrin that would show him how much he had purchased of particular securities. Uh, there were occasional months where the amount of securities that he held at the end of a month turned out to be a little bit greater than what he should have purchased. Um, that's because you're making purchases all through the month, but we were only able to measure what the balances were at the end of a month, and we would, we would inform him what those were and he would take action upon it. Thank you. Now, I think, uh, Senator Craven, do you have some questions? <coughs> Thank you. Mr. Ravy, I have <coughs> copies of uh, your local paper, <coughs> the Register, and here in a headline you describe as Deputy of Deception. <coughs> in another headline, Ravy aid back Citroen was point man for investment strategy. <coughs> as I understand your comments thus far, you have indicated anything but what those headlines would lead us to believe. Uh, I suppose it would be somewhat <clears throat> naive for me to ask you, but I'm going to, uh, what you think of that article, or those articles. Senator, That's you all don't, one. You don't believe all the headlines that they write about the, the Senate, do you, sir? I'm sorry to hear you. I'm sure that we don't all believe the headlines that they write about the Senate or the or the House. Well, that's not the question that I asked, <laughs> okay. whether we were talking about the Senate or the House. I was asking Mr. Ravy what he thought about an article which mentions him rather profusely. Well, I, number one, I think that, that when one reads the article, oh. uh, one comes away with a different conclusion than what that headline says. Mm -hmm. um, certainly, it... It is clear that uh, beginning in 1991 to 1992, sometime in that period, Mr. Citrin asked me to start responding to inquiries about the fund. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the assignments he gave me, and I did that. And that was a very low profile type assignment until the election came up in uh, 1994 and in April of 1994 when there were a lot of newspaper articles about the fund and a lot of questions uh, I was asked a lot more questions and, and assumed a more visible position explaining what Mr. Citrin's strategies were. That is completely different from what that is saying in that I was the point man in the strategy. I was not the person who defined investment strategy and I was not the person who made investment decisions and the newspaper is wrong when it makes that implication. Did you at any time... Could I have huh. just one moment, uh, Senator? You may. Um, if, if you would like to go through the different allegations in that article, I would be happy to respond to them one by one. Well, let me just take the one, first one that comes to notice here, to my notice. This is a quotation. You will not share market gain nor have risk of any market loss, Ravy wrote to the Newport Mesa School District. No risk related to the 46960000 principal amount, end quote. Did you say that? I did say that, but I'd like to put it in its proper context. Okay. <clears throat> in the spring of 1993, four educational districts uh, sent their financial advisor to see Mr. Citrin, and they asked him if he would issue uh, upwards of a billion dollars in taxable notes for the educational districts, and Mr. Citrin said no. That financial advisor returned at a later date and asked Mr. Citrin if he would issue $200 million in taxable notes for four specific educational districts and invest those monies outside of the commingled investment fund. And he agreed to do that after some discussion with them. In June of 1993, 
those educational districts did issue $200 million in taxable notes, and Mr. Citrin purchased $200 million in securities specifically for those districts. Subsequent to that, a letter was sent to those districts explaining that they assumed all of the risk on the investments that were made. And that, that letter said that those districts would take the gain or the loss if they had to sell those securities before they matured. Subsequent to that letter, one of those four educational districts developed a problem with one of their local people, and they called and they asked Mr. Citrin if he would modify that investment and be willing to take it back into the commingled fund at the end of one year. Mr. Citrin asked me to look into whether that was a legal thing to do. I contacted the county council's office and I had a discussion and the county council's office said that if we were going to take that security back into the pool in June of 1994, regardless of its market value, that that would be an acceptable transaction to enter into. And so Mr. Citrin consented to modify what the districts had agreed to in the first place. That transaction was completed in June of 1994, and those notes were paid off on behalf of all of those school districts, and they did receive all of their principal back. I have one last <coughs> question to ask you. Uh, you've given me the impression, or perhaps others as well, that you were really an administrator, that you were not involved with the day-to-day -day, uh, proselyting of various districts and or organizations to invest in the fund which you represented. You didn't do that. Well, let me... <coughs> excuse me. Let me, let me clarify what I think you're asking me. <coughs> Number one, um, when you say it was proselytizing on a day-to-day -day basis to get people to enter the fund, I'm presuming that what you're saying is that I was out selling this fund to other people. Is, is that safe to say? I would say <clears throat> that's moving in the right direction. Well, <laughs> well let, me, let me clarify that because I think that's a major misconception that's out there. Number one, starting around 1991 to 1992, People were calling Mr. Citrin and asking if he would allow them to enter the fund. Mm -hmm. And if they, if they called and they wanted to come into the fund, we had a set of documents which we sent out to those people so that they could invest in the fund. Some of those people asked if Mr. Citrin would come out or send someone else out to explain the fund and he assigned me to go out and do that. In no instance did he ever ask me to go out to speak to anyone who had not called and asked him or someone else to come out and explain the fund to them. We were not proselytizing, we were not selling the fund, we were explaining the fund to the people who had questions and generally they asked questions before I was sent out and I would go out and explain the questions that they were asking and there is a major difference in that to what uh, the impression that may be going around. I'd say there is a very major <coughs> difference. Uh, then I, uh, as I understand it, I, you never went out uh, to uh, try to bring people into the fund. They did it of their own volition. There was no desire to increase the size of this fund. It, it happened just as a matter of time. Well, it's not a question of <clears throat> desire, it's a question of act. Did you do so? Or did anyone representing the treasurer do so? I'm not aware of what anybody else representing the treasurer's office did. I did not go out and ask anyone to put money in the fund. I went out and explained the fund to people who called and asked if I would come out and explain the fund. So, to get back to where, where we started, you would say the interpretation, uh, given your activity by this newspaper, is not correct. That's what I would say. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I do have one more question. Um, how often did you uh, accompany Mr. Oh, yeah. Citron in his meetings with uh, Merrill Lynch or other other investment broking brokerage? Firms? Most of the time, when Mr. Citron met with investment brokers or economists or other people, he met with them without me being present. Sometimes he met on his own. Sometimes he took the investment officer or some of the investment staff with him. There were a few occasions when Mr. Citron had a technical question regarding how 
particular procedures needed to be followed or how certain accounting methods needed to be treated that he would ask me in. And there were also a few occasions when a new product was being pitched to him that he would have me come in and, and be a sounding board. And uh, how often did you meet with them separately without Mr. Citron? That I met with in investment brokers? Yes. I only recall two instances where I met uh, with any kind of an investment broker uh, outside of Mr. Citron's presence, although there, there were some who would, who would come in and talk. Uh, I should clarify that. There, there were two instances I met with Merrill Lynch. Uh, separate from Mr. Citron. There were other instances where an investment broker would want to do business with the county and Mr. Citron would have me filter those, in which case they would come and they would talk about what they had to offer for the county. I would tell them that they would need to send financial statements, that I would review the financial statements and pass those on to Mr. Citron. And that, that allowed him not to, to have to interface with people who he wasn't going to do business with. I think uh, senators can understand, the senator staff can understand that answer. <laughs> Thank you. But, but generally speaking, if, if you're asking about when I had substantive yes. Uh, That's conversations really with brokers. I only recall two conversations that I had with Mr. Stamenson from Merrill Lynch. And do you remember what those were about? Um, generally speaking. Um, Not generally speaking. <laughs> well, in, in July of 1984, uh, Mr. Stamenson called me. 1994. 1994, yes. thank you. Uh -huh. In 1994, Mr. Stamenson uh, called me and said that he was going to be flying down to Orange County and would I meet him at his hotel for dinner? And I, I said that I would. And over dinner, he explained to me um, some of the recommendations he was going to be making to Mr. Citron the next day. And he asked if I would uh, provide some concurrence to those recommendations. Then again, um, and my recollection isn't perfect on this, but I, I believe it to be uh, either mid to late September or early October 1994. I initiated, no, it would have been September, um, I initiated a telephone call to uh, Mr. Stamenson and asked for his assistance in uh, talking to Mr. Citrin about um, the amount of leverage in the fund. Uh, and what was his response on that? Mr. Stamenson's response. Yes. He agreed to meet me and he flew down to Orange County and uh, he and I met one evening and discussed uh, the situation. Thank you. All right. Uh, now I'm going to let allow the, give the other uh, senators a chance. We have Senator Kopp first. Thank, thank you, Madam uh, Chairwoman. Uh, Mr. Raby, <coughs> did you hear Mr. Citron testify? Uh, yes, I did. Okay. You recall, uh, of course, he testified that there was pressure to generate yield, higher, higher, higher yield. You recall that? I recall him saying right. that. And do uh, you recall he said, uh, and he used the word they, they would pressure me to uh, increase the uh, yield. Can you tell us uh, whether there was ever any open and public meeting of any board or commission or committee of Orange County at which there was any dialogue or colloquy about increasing the yield? Mm -hmm. Well, when you talk ever, you're talking a long time. Let, let me no, address, I'm talking let me address, well, let me <clears throat> narrow it. Let me thank you. bring it from the time you became the assistant treasurer. From that time, I'm not aware of, right. of, of any of those kinds of conversations. Were you ever privy to any conversation with any county officer, agent, or employee in which you or Mr. Citron was invade to increase the yield? Not until uh, the time around June 1994. All right. And uh, would you describe uh, the first of such uh, meetings? Where was it and who was present? I was uh, asked to go over to the county administrative office to discuss um, questions about the county's 1994-95 uh, budget situation. 
and I met with the uh, the budget manager for the county. Who is that? Uh, that would be Fred Bronca, and uh, and one of his assistants. Who is the assistant? Uh, the name escapes me at the moment. I'm sorry. All right. um, what did Mr. Bronco say to you? At, at any rate, uh, the discussion was on uh, how severe the county's budget was going to be and how uh, Mr. Citrin's interest rate uh, projection for the 1994-95 fiscal year was lower than the 1993-94 budget year and, uh, and, and what that was going to mean to uh, county operations and the, the question arose as to whether there would be any way for Mr. Citrin to earn any additional interest revenue during 1994-95 fiscal year that might help the county out with this budget problem. And what did you say? I told them that I would talk to Mr. Citrin and relay their concerns. Um, we had kicked around a few ideas as to what they had in mind and uh, the main thing that came up was increasing the county's uh, taxable note issuance from $400 million to $600 million and using the uh, arbitrage income on the extra $200 million to help fund uh, county projects. You say you had kicked it around. Who do you mean by you? You and Mr. Citron or you and Mr. That came really from the discussions with uh, Mr. Bronca and, and his staff as, as to what things were in mind. As I recall, there were other items that, that were mentioned, but I don't recall exactly what they were. It, it was the increase of $200 million in taxable notes that was eventually agreed to by Mr. Citron. And, that, and then on June 14th, the Board of Supervisors approved a resolution that authorized that. I don't know the exact date, but it would have been around that point in time. Did you have further conversations with anybody in county government with respect to increasing the yield between that conversation and December 5th or 6th of 94? I don't recall having any, any other conversations with uh, any county officials on, on that topic. All right, now, you were present at one or more meetings with the uh, representatives of the Federal Securities and Exchange Commission, correct? I was present at, at one meeting. Uh, Where was that meeting? That was in the SEC offices in Los Angeles. Who else was there? Pardon me? Who else was present? Uh, Mr. Citron was present, uh, the county council was present, and uh, an attorney uh, from LaBeouf, Lamb, Green, and McRae was present. And for the record, what's the name of county council? Terry Andrus. Okay. And who was there from the SEC? Uh, there were four or five people there. Do you have notes or a memorandum of that meeting? No, I do not. Do you know whether anybody kept notes or a memorandum of that meeting? I, I don't know specifically. I, I saw um, uh, John Cotton taking some notes. I don't know to what extent he did take notes. And he's the lawyer from LaBeouf? Yes, sir. Okay. And what did the SEC representatives uh, say to you, Mr. Citron, about their uh, concerns? What were they concerned? Well, they, they did not express any of their questions in the term that they had concerns. They expressed that they had read the newspaper articles and were inquiring about the facts that were in the newspaper articles. And, I, and to my knowledge, they never said they had concerns. Uh, but regardless of that, they, they spoke, uh, asked questions about what the investment strategy was how the portfolio was leveraged, what type of liquidity was in the portfolio. And then they asked a lot of questions about the accounting treatment, uh, what kind of accounting reports we, res we uh, obtained, what kind of accounting reports we sent out to people, and uh, what kind of documents we received from people and sent out to people. How long was the meeting? I recall it being about four hours. Newspaper articles included uh, assertions by Mr. John Morlock with respect to the conduct of uh, Mr. Centron. The content of some of the things Mr. Morlock was saying were included in the SEC questions. Uh, did the SEC representatives ask for uh, documents? 
they asked for a number of documents, all of which we supplied. Uh, there were Later on, or were you supplying them? <clears throat> Most of those documents were in advance of the meeting. Mm -hmm. What was uh, the conclusion of that meeting? When that meeting was over, Mr. Citron and I left and, uh, and went back to the county offices. Well, what did the SEC representatives say to conclude the meeting? Did they say... They said, thank you for coming. They did, not, they did not provide any conclusions to us as to what they were thinking or what they might do next. But you provided them, or Mr. Citron and you and your attorneys provided all the information about the amount of money that uh, had been borrowed about the investment devices uh, which had been used. Is That's that correct. correct? That's correct. And you gave them full disclosure of all that? We gave them everything that, w that we had in our possession, and we gave them everything that they asked us that, that seemed relevant. And then you never heard, uh, your office never heard from the SEC again? I never heard from the SEC again. Well, do you... I don't know that anyone else in the office heard from the SEC again. Well, did you and Mr. Citron talk on a regular daily basis? Sometimes we would talk and a lot of times uh, we didn't talk. We certainly talked a lot more during the, uh, the summer and fall of 1994 than we had previously. Well, as far as you know, there was uh, no further word from the SEC. That's, that's what I understand. All right. Uh, during the course of the uh, campaign for county treasurer, uh, you knew that Mr. John Morlack had written a uh, lengthy letter dated May 31st, 1994 to Mr. Uh, Thomas Riley as chairman of the Board of Supervisors, correct? I'm aware that he wrote a letter. Did you ever read the letter? Yes, I did. Okay. Do you find it uh, strange that Mr. Citron would testify under oath that he never read that letter? I don't know that Mr. Citron ever did read the letter. I, I know that I read the letter. I, I'm not even sure I ever discussed the letter with Mr. Citron. And you read the letter on or about May 31st or June 1st? I wouldn't want to pin it down to a date like that. I read it sometime after it was issued, and I'm sure it, it would have been did you read it, June. Did you read it before the election? Yes, I did. All right. After you read it, uh, did you discuss it with anyone? I don't recall discussing it with anyone. Did it make any kind of an impression upon you? Not particularly. Mr. Citron had said all through the election and, and you know, when, when the different newspaper articles would come out that there, there was a concerted effort against him and that people were going to make a lot of claims. And uh, he, was, he was refuting what people were saying in the press all the time. There wasn't much in Mr. Morlock's letter, as I recall, that hadn't already been printed in the newspapers. Well, you've been in the uh, treasurer's office uh, for how long a period of time by then? Six years? About that. And you'd been the assistant for 14, 15 months, correct? About that, yes. Is there any inaccuracy, uh, any substantial inaccuracy in what Mr. Morlock set down? I'd really need to see that letter if, if I could take a look at well, it. Well, uh, you. you can take a look at it now, but I'm talking about the time between May 31st and June 7th of last year. <laughs> Did you find any substantial inaccuracy in what he set forth? Can we see the letter, uh, Senator? Sergeant, give him the letter, and would you answer my question, Mr. Raby? Counsel, what is it? He needs it to refresh his recollection as to what he concluded in the period between May 31st and June 7th? Senator, when you ask a question whether there are any inaccuracies in, no. a, in a letter... I asked I him whether in that period from May 31st to June 7th when he read that letter whether he then found any substantial inaccuracies not whether he finds any substantial inaccuracies now at, at that point in time I did not think that anything that uh, that Mr. Citron had been telling me was inaccurate and uh, the answers that he was giving me to the types of things that Mr. Morlock were saying made perfect sense to me I asked you, did you find anything Mr. Morlock stated in that letter to be inaccurate? Well, then he does need to read the letter, Senator, in order to answer that question. I don't, I don't know He's simply not answering the question. Well, I'm not trying to avoid the answer, but Mr. Morlock wrote what looks to be an eight-page letter, and you're That's asking correct. me if there's anything in there that I disagree with, and I don't remember everything that was in the letter. That, that, that's completely different. 
All right. I'm not asking well, you Senator, for your I can present tell you, he, state of mind or your present conclusion. I'm asking you whether you concluded then that there was anything inaccurate. I, I can't answer that question. All right. Uh, let me just cover one other subject with you, and thank you for your patience, uh, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, with respect to the testimony to this committee that uh, in June of 1994, uh, there was a decision to exclude Payne uh, Weber from uh, participation in the uh, borrowing uh, transactions. Uh, do you know who made that decision? There, there wasn't, I wouldn't characterize it as a decision to exclude Payne Weber from the financing transaction. More to the point, 